Okay. Uh, so if you remember, we said that uh, it's a name peril policy. Uh, we also said that in a name peril policy, the perils that are named are crucial because only those perils are covered which are named, nothing else is covered. And we also understood the concept of the proximate cause and through examples we talked about how even if there is a rainwater damage consequent to a storm, the storm could be the proximate cause or in the case of tsunami how earthquake could be a proximate cause. And the perils that you remember that we said were the standard part of a Indian fire policy, not necessarily outside India. Outside India, it's possible that the number of perils that are covered is lesser or there's a part of the standard policy, whereas they may come in as an add-on peril outside India. But as far as India is concerned, there are 12 perils that are covered under the policy. Those 12 perils are fire, you had explosion, implosion, you had aircraft damage, you had riot strike, malicious damage, you had lightning. So you had, uh, including missile testing, storm, tempest, flood inundation, uh, you had subsidence, landslide, so you had 12 different perils that were covered as a part of the standard fire policy. Now what we do is, after looking at the coverages, let's look at what are these extensions or what we call as the add-on perils that can be possible under a fire policy. If you had noted, one of the major perils that is not part of the standard perils is earthquake. Another peril which is not part of the standard perils is terrorism. And as I told you, terrorism is a cover which has not been available in the international market as in as an available cover automatically. You need to buy it as an add-on period or an extension by paying additional premium because terrorism capacity had dried out. So let's look at what are those additional perils. The first peril that you talk about is earthquake. If you remember when we were looking at earthquake as a hazard, and we were looking at what are those parameters which will determine the risk involved. We said that the zone in which it falls, that is the location, becomes a very important thing. We also said as far as India is concerned, it's, it has been classified into four zones. Zone 1 being in the highest zone and zone 4 is the lowest zone. Besides the zone, your class of construction or the construction material that is used becomes very important. The other important aspect we said was soil conditions was very, very crucial and I gave you the example of a uh, reclaimed land, especially from the sea, which could have, have a huge impact in terms of earthquake loss or damage that can occur. So I hope you will agree with me that if those are the main parameters that are required, then it becomes very, very crucial that in your pricing also those become the important parameters. So when you price your earthquake, one of the important parameters will be the fact where it is located. That means the specific zone in which that particular location is there. The risk is located in which location. Other than that, your construction, your soil features, all of them will be discount or loading factors on the earthquake peril. So this is something that you, based on a location, your rate will change. To just give an example, uh, in India, in the days there were tariffs, today they don't have tariffs. The rate for zone 1 used to be 1 per milli, whereas for zone 4 would be, used to be 0.1 per milli. So that gives you an indication of how much important location is, that there are some locations which are highly prone to earthquake, you need to be charging adequate rate, otherwise you will not be appropriately pricing a particular risk from an earthquake perspective. The second aspect, second add-on cover is, as we said, impact by rail, road or vehicle or animal was an inbuilt cover under the fire policy. At that point of time, I told you that if it is by your own vehicle, it is not covered under the fire policy. If you want that coverage, then you have to buy this add-on cover called as impact by own vehicles. If you need to look at an example where this would be very useful, for example, you are an automobile manufacturer. If you are an automobile manufacturer, you will know that you will have a racing track or a testing track around the automobile factory. Once you manufacture your cars, you test the cars around. While you are testing the cars, it's possible that that car comes and hits some other cars or some other machines or some other building. They can be damaged. 
your original policy, which was your standard policy, would not have covered it because it was its own vehicle. If you want such coverage to be there, you need to be ensuring that you are covering it as an add-on period. This is the second add-on period. The third add-on period that we talk about is architect's fees. As you would appreciate that if, for example, this building gets lost, damaged, now when the building gets damaged, you need to again spend money to, for the architect to designing this building again. Now, your original summit shoe did not include it. Hence, if you want that to be covered, you need to be paying extra premium and taking this add-on coverage, which is known as an architect's fees coverage. Fundamentally, in Indian policies, up to the small percentage, some of these perils are automatically covered. Something like 1%, 2%, 3%, they are all given in the tariff, you can look at it. Those wordings are there. That's not important. Most important thing is, beyond that particular limit, you need to be buying as an add-on peril. Otherwise, it is not covered. In most policies outside India, these are not covered even up to 1%, 2%. You will have to buy it as an add-on peril. So it's a very, very important add-on peril that you need to be covering. The next thing is removal of debris. As you depreciate, removal of once a building is damaged, a lot of debris is created. If this building is damaged, you will have a lot of debris related to steel, cement, concrete, stones, everything getting, you will have to remove it. And to remove it from this location, it costs money. So, if you want that cost to be covered under your policy, you have to take this extension of removal of debris. In most countries like India, probably removal of debris is not such an important uh, uh, coverage because uh, you can just remove the debris from your building and throw it into your neighbor's building. Is it not? That's what we do. Uh, so, you can, uh, even if you see the shops that are cleaned, they will just sweep the floor and throw the dust onto the next, next one and that guy will sweep and put it over here. <laughs> so that is how the entire uh, removal of debris means. But just to give an example, the debris related to the World Trade Center, all that steel and all that, in US came to India. So that means they not only they gave it free of cost, they also spent the money to transport it to India so that we can use it. Because in countries which are developed where environment is a very, very important factor, you can't just throw your debris anywhere. It costs a huge amount of money to be actually removing to a safe place and putting it over there. There are uh, places where you are allowed to. You can't put it into the sea. In India, you put anything to the sea. That's not allowed. So, environmentally conscious countries, you will have a huge amount of expenditure that will be required in terms of removal debris. And India is also progressing towards that particular level, wherein you have more of environmental consciousness. So, removal of debris we cover becomes a very, very important cover. Having said that, please understand, external debris is not usually covered in your removal of debris cover. It is your own property's debris. That means I am covering this, this property is damaged, the debris that is created. But when you have floods, for example, if you have hydropower plants, when you have floods in hydropower plants, all the, rock, the rocks, mud, everything comes and settles down in the power house. This is not the debris related to the power plant, it is the external debris. So even if you bought this extension, external debris is not covered. If you want to cover external debris, then you need to negotiate with the insurance company and buy it separately. Otherwise, as a standard part, when you talk about debris removal, it is always the debris related to the insured property. So that is the extension that is covered as far as removal of debris is concerned. The next thing is the deterioration of stocks. As you would appreciate that when there is a fire or a machinery breakdown or any other thing which leads to a power failure and suppose there are some stocks in the, in the cold storages and if you have stocks in the cold storages they will certainly be affected if a power fails because the temperature will rise because each of the material that is stored in the cold storages you need to be storing at certain temperature. If it is a ice cream or something, you have to store it at minus at less than zero degrees centigrade. 
If it is say chilies or something, probably you have to put it at 15 degrees centigrade. So you have for different materials, you have to have different temperature. Meat should be put at a particular temperature. Potato should be put at a particular temperature. So once your power is off, your temperature will rise and the material will spoil. If you want to cover it, consequent to any of the insured periods that you are talking about, you need to be covering under the deterioration of stocks. So when you buy a policy, fire insurance policy for your cold storages, unless you take this particular extension related to deterioration of stocks, if it is a direct fire damage, it's covered. But a damage, a indirect damage wherein because of the because of the insured period, you had a loss, a power supply cut, because of which your temperature has risen, because of which your stocks have deteriorated, that does not get covered under your uh, standard policy. You need to be buying it as a part of a deterioration of stocks policy. Other than that, there is another extension called forest fire. If you remember, we said bush fire is a part of your standard policy or your basic policy covered in bush fire. But I told you it doesn't cover forest fire. If you need to be covering forest fire and the forest fires, I, I hope most of you would be seeing the one in California or the one in Australia and other things, the amount of damage that they can create, it can be huge damage. And not just that those type of forest fires which are actually catastrophic, in India we don't really see those catastrophic level of forest fires. But to just give an example, we used to cover for a forest fire extension uh, for a paper mill, which for whom the raw material is bamboo. If bamboo is your raw material, normally what happens is the, the bamboos are in the forest. The forest usually belongs to the government. These paper manufacturers auction from the government. Sorry, government auctions it and the paper manufacturers buy it on auction from the government. And when they buy it, they usually store it. Once after buying it, before they transfer it to the uh, factory, they will store it in the forest. If there is a damage that occurs because of forest fire, you need to be taking this particular extension. So it's not just the forest fire related to the massive forest fires that you see in California or Australia. Even otherwise, there can be cases where you need to take a forest fire extension in terms of wherever you believe. In each of these extensions, it's not necessary other than earthquake that you need to be taking it in every case. You can always have, for example, deterioration of stocks. You are looking to only those specific stocks which are in the cold storages. When you are talking about forest fire, uh, you can only take those which are exposed to those stocks. You don't need to cover every stock. Those stocks which are exposed to forest fire, you can be covering it under this particular extension. Right? The next extension, as I told you, is. Covers so indemnity clauses. Which one? This is in the property is an indemnity clause. Yeah, please understand. When you talk about uh, a property policy, it's always the principle of indemnity will be applied. So when you talk about property, of, uh, the principle of indemnity, what you are talking about is putting back the insured in the same position as your other boss. But I think what you are asking me is, it is not covered on a full sum insured basis. You are giving him an option to insure it for a specified sum insured. This is something like a first loss policy. Like in a burglary policy or first loss policy, that means you decide your sublimit and for that sublimit you buy. Similarly, in this particular case, instead of deciding a sublimit, what you do is you decide your sum insured relating to the stock which can be affected, you actually identify that and buy for that particular stock. My question is in case this cost only one lakh. Yeah. Taking into consideration all this, can I insure this property for one lakh fifty thousand? Yeah. So uh, this is nothing to do with the extensions. It's a separate question that you are asking me. Nothing to do as far extension is concerned. So uh, since you asked it, I'll just cover it. Uh, probably we'll cover it later also. But uh, fundamentally, you need to understand that when you say a particular property policy and this value of this building is say hundred million. If the value of this property is 100 million, you are supposed to insure it for 100 million. You can insure it for more, but when a claim comes, you are not going to get more, you are only going to get what you have lost. 
So that is where the principle of indemnity comes. But if you insure it for less, then you are supposed, the insured is supposed to be the insurer for, his, for that particular portion which he has not insured. For example, if the value of this property is 100 million, he has insured it for 80 million. What it means is, he is his own insurer for 20 million. Whereas the 80 million is what has been transferred to the insurance company. So when a claim comes, suppose of 1 million, then only 80 by 100 or 80 percent of the claim is paid. 20 percent of the claim he will suffer under a principle called as principle of average or principle of under insurance. So that is what is the important thing that we do. So to repeat, to uh, repeat what I said, if it is insured for more, he is not going to be paid more. If he pays, if insured for less, he will be penalized for under insurance. Even in total loss, he just. They will be giving only. Yeah. In, even in a total loss case, under insurance will be applied. But please understand, uh, I think what I will do is I will show you a problem uh, when we are doing about uh, uh, this concept of under insurance. Then you will understand. It doesn't really affect in a total loss case because at the end of the day you are going to give this. You will be suffering without any doubt. But you will be giving the sum and show. Because it is already under insured, so it already gets penalized. But when I show you a problem, you will understand it better uh, in terms of how it actually works. Yeah. So at this stage, we are coming back to the extensions. Within the extensions, when we talk about spontaneous combustion, I hope you remember, I said, though fire is covered, ex exclusion is spontaneous combustion or self-eating or any of this. That is the reason why when you are going to cover spontaneous combustion, you are having material which are prone to spontaneous combustion. I gave you examples like coal, sponge iron, all of these are prone to spontaneous combustion. And hence, it becomes very, very important that you take this extension only for those stocks which are prone to spontaneous combustion. So if you take that, the spontaneous combustion stands covered. Otherwise, any loss or damage that occurs because of spontaneous combustion stands excluded under the fire. The next thing is the temporary removal of stocks. As you know, any property policy and for that matter fire policy is a location specific policy. So when you are talking about a location specific policy, it means I am covering stocks or building or machinery at a particular location. If you remove those stocks from this location and put it some other location, Unless you have informed me and added that location into my policy, that will not be covered. But many a times, stocks may have to be removed temporarily for some job work or some other such works. So in those cases, if you take this particular extension, then up to that particular limit, your temporary removal of stocks will be standing, standing covered. The next thing is the loss of rent. Again, please understand when you are covering a particular property, if I am the owner of this particular property, if a fire loss occurs or any of the insured period losses occur, then if I rented it out, rented out the premises and I was say enjoying 50,000 rupees as the rent per month. <coughs> now when a damage occurs and this property is affected for 6 months, for 6 months I not only lost the the building, in this case, I need to reinstate the building. I also lose the rent. If I want to cover that particular rent, that is covered under the loss of rent. That means you are covering additionally the rent that is lost. There is another thing called loss of or insurance of additional rent. There is a slight difference between loss of rent and insurance of additional rent. Loss of rent is usually taken by the owner of the building. But if I am a tenant of the building, if I was a tenant of this particular building and I was paying 50,000 rent, a fire occurs, I need to vacate this building. I need to look for an alternative building. When I look at for an alternative building in emergency, it is possible that I may not get a similar building for 50,000. I may be paying 70,000. So if you want that additional 20,000 to be covered, not the entire 70,000, only that additional rent that you are forced to pay consequent to a loss or damage, then you can cover under the loss of additional rent. Am I clear here? The difference between loss of rent and loss of additional rent? The next thing is the startup expenses. 
fundamentally, when you talk about an industry, in any industry, when a particular plant is lost or damaged, <coughs> once you repair it or replace it, usually you can't just immediately start it. There are certain expenses that you have to incur to start up the entire plant again. Because it takes time. If it is a high temperature thing, it takes time for the temperature to build up. If it requires a catalyst, you have to again re put the catalyst. So there are a lot of expenses that you have to necessarily and reasonably incur in order to ensure that you start up the plant after the plant has been shut down because of a insured peril loss or damage. If you want to cover that, that is covered under startup expenses. Having said that, I will just tell you an interesting claim that we settled. Uh, there was a multinational bank that we were covering, uh, and uh, we, whose uh, head office was in Mumbai. They had a branch office in Delhi, another city of India, the capital of India. Now, what happened was they had taken this extension of startup expenses, and there was a major fire in the Delhi branch. When there was a major fire in the Delhi branch, the employees from the head office in Mumbai flew down in business class to Delhi, stayed in five-star hotels to help the branch in Delhi to start up. And they said, these are reasonably required because my employees are entitled to business class, they traveled in business class. They are entitled to five star hotel, they stayed in five star hotel. It's not that because of claim they are doing it, even otherwise any tour they will travel by business class, any tour they will stay in five star hotel, so nothing unreasonable rate is it has been reasonable. Was it necessary? Yes, it was necessary. If they had not gone, my Delhi branch could not have started so fast. So, because the wording is so broad, it says reasonably and necessarily incurred to start up after a loss. Everything met that particular requirement. We have to pay that particular claim. So many because the whole startup expenses add-on period was started off from a manufacturing company perspective, but it's quite possible that it may be useful in terms of many other cases also when you have such a broad meaning that has been given to the very wording that has been. Yeah. And the last thing, as I told you, is terrorism. Fundamentally, it's not a standard cover. You need to be covering terrorism as a separate coverage. Now, because you are writing an exam in India, you need to understand what is the mechanism that is there as far as terrorism is there in cover. Cover is there in India. Now, before we get into it, you need to understand very, very crucial. It's a very standard definition used worldwide of what is terrorism. Now, to talk about terrorism, it say to the use of force or violence and bar or thereof of any person or groups of persons, whether acting alone or on behalf of or in connection with any organization or governments committed for political, religious, ideological or similar purposes, including the intention to influence any government or to put the public or any section of the public in fear. Fundamentally, this is the usual standard definition that is used. Now, there have been disputes, even in the case I showed you in the last class, I showed you a bank of right. The terrorism insurer was saying it's a right. The terrorism insurer was saying it's a Sorry, terrorism insurer was saying it's a right. The IAR insurer was saying it's a terrorism. And both were disputing and not paying the claims. Now, fundamentally, it was a right wherein two political parties, one party in power, one party in opposition, the followers of the second party which was in opposition, wanted to overthrow the government. They were giving very, very provocative speeches. They said, burn down Bangkok. They said, burn down Central World Building. And when the military came in and arrested the leaders, these people were going out, going back, and started damaging a lot of property. Now, if you look at this definition, was that not done for political purposes? Was that not done with the intention of creating a fear in public? So if you look at this particular definition, 
it is quite possible that it can be treated as a right, it may be treated as a terrorism and there are instances in the world where both have landed up in big trouble and as a regulator, my our friend in the regulator will understand, it's a very, very important call that regulators will need to take across the world that when you are giving such vague things, it's quite possible that because now it is, if you are giving to the state insurer, the problems are less. But many times, your insurers are different. And there is always a possibility that both insurers are disputing and not paying that particular claim. It's very, very crucial that it, the definition, there has to be a memorandum of understanding or an agreement wherein people are very clearly telling what exactly falls into right, what exactly falls into terrorism. Uh, one of the ways that uh, it is done is that, for example, every country has some prescribed organizations or people whom they prescribe as terrorist organizations. For example, India itself says Lashkar e Taiba or, uh, or Indian Mujahideen or ALTT, all of them they are listed as a terrorist organizations. So you can say that if they are done by those organizations, it is terrorism, otherwise it's a right. Unless you are very, very clear about it, it is a, often a disputable thing as between the right and terrorism. But as far as you are concerned as a student, it's very crucial for you to understand that in India, we have something called as a terrorism pool. Now what is this all terrorism pool? So as you know, after September 1st, uh, September 11th, 2001, Terrorism capacity had dried out. Total losses for the World Trade Center was almost 31 billion US dollars. Indian mark in the year 2002, April 1st, 2002, there was no terrorism capacity in India that was coming up. So what was done is a pool was created called the terrorism pool. That was created in April 1st, 2002. So once this was created, now this is a combined entire, and as you know how the pool works, all the participants, all the members of the uh, industry, they pool together, they pool their capacity, somebody will be the administrator. In India, the national reinsurance company called the GICD was the administrator of that particular pool. All the members were participants in it, the different percentages that were there. And when a premium was made, premium was paid, the entire premium is to go into the pool and claims are also paid by the pool. So that means whichever company is insuring it, it doesn't really matter because all that they do is they take the premium, send it to the pool. If a claim comes, the pool is going to pay out that particular claim. So that is how a pool works. So when you have a pool, majority of the risks in the Indian market go into the pool. That means as an endorsement to a fire insurance policy, a terrorism endorsement is given. Based on that particular terrorism endorsement, whatever premium is there, it gets into the pool. Claims are also paid out of the pool. But as you would appreciate, it's a free market. It's not that everybody needs to go into the pool. So, other than the pool, there is also a possibility that you take an independent terrorism and sabotage coverage. There is a policy called as TNS, Terrorism and Sabotage Coverage. There is another policy called as Political Violence Policy. Political violence is a broader policy. It not only covers terrorism and sabotage, it also covers war, it also covers riot strike and other things. So it's a far wider coverage which covers a lot more things. So it can be a TNS policy which is terrorism and sabotage or political violence policy. Now this is an internationally driven policy. Most of the pricing and most of the capacity usually comes from Lloyds in London. So this independent policy, because the rates in the independent policies tended to be lower than the pool rates, lot of the larger companies started going and taking independent policies. So when you talk about terrorism risk in India, majority of the risk goes into the pool. 
but there are substantial large risks which are also given independent terrorism and sabotage policy or a political violence policy. So this is broadly about terrorism coverage as far as India is concerned. So combined underwriting capacity of market with GIC is administrator, covered as an add-on cover using endorsement. Limit of liability was previously 1500 crores which has now been increased, I don't remember the figure, I think it's 2250 crores or something. But please understand that limit of 20 to 50 crores which basically is 22.5 billion Indian rupees, billion Indian rupees. So uh, a crore is 10 billion. So for those of our friends not from India, it's one crore is 10 billion, uh, 10 billion. So it is 22.5 billion Indian rupees is the capacity. What it actually means is in one event, the total capacity that the pool has is 22.5. That means you might have to be covering different risks. They will not be covered for the full value because the maximum that the pool is going to pay is this particular limit that is there as far as the pool capacity is concerned. Also remember the pool itself is reinsured using usually an excess of loss basis. So you will have a reinsurance above a particular level which is being taken care of which will protect the pool from any large losses. And to know what are the losses that were paid by the pool, only one major loss was paid and that was related to the Mumbai terror attack when almost uh, 4.5 billion Indian rupees which is 450 crores which basically is 4.5 billion Indian rupees was paid. That was the only known large loss that has been suffered by the pool otherwise it has been a highly profitable pool. So this broadly is about the Indian terrorism pool. There were three companies which are involved, okay. So this limit applies for that location or for it's, a, it's for event per location. So including all the companies? Yes, all, all, the, all the people. So that was not a problem because it's only 450 crores against 1500 crores, but yes, if it was a much bigger loss, then the entire thing would not have been big. So that's something that you have. Not only that, when you talk about terrorism, coverage. There are a lot of intricate things. For example, many a times terrorist damage may not necessarily be that high, but the counter operations by the military or the police may cause huge amount of damage. So your wording should take care of whether you are going to cover it. Otherwise, if you don't take care of that, it's quite possible that it can end up in a dispute. Whether a counter operations by the police or the military which results to a loss or damage, whether that also is covered or not. So, otherwise, it meant if you say only because of terrorism, then it's quite possible that the within the India in India it's covered. So, if you put a within the terrorism wording, you put a clause which says that including the operations they are done by security forces in fighting the terrorist attacks. So, that's what you have to take care. Uh, unless you, these are all, this, please understand these are all contract wordings. So unless you actually negotiate and ensure that, the contract, when I say you, I mean the insured, negotiates the contract wordings, it can quite possibly in a claim situation lead to a lot of unhappiness or dispute uh, between the client and the insurer. So that's something that should be avoided. Yeah. So I'm saying that if it's not mentioned, yeah. approximately cost uh, still remains Proximate cause is terrorism. We are not talking about the proximate cause. It's quite possible that the terrorists have come and not done anything. Because always policies will talk about direct physical loss or damage. So you need to have a direct physical loss or damage. For example, terrorists had come and uh, shut themselves in a room and then the military took over. They are not attacking anything. They were planning to do it and then military. Now military to catch them, they started shooting, damaging, uh, breaking, uh, breaking doors, windows, everything and doing it. Do you cover it or do you not? So fundamentally you need to understand that it's not necessarily 
that just because the proximate cause is there, every consequential loss will be covered. One of the exclusions in the policy very clearly says all consequential losses are excluded. So unless you are making these things clear, please understand in a claim situation it's not as simple as we think that every claim will be very very clear that it's payable or not payable. You can always have interpretations related to that. So it's always crucial that as insurance companies, if insurance name should not be spoiled because that's the only promise you are making. At the end of the day as an insurance company, the it's a paper, piece of paper that you are giving, promising him that in case of a claim you are going to pay. And there if you find interpretations, where difference of interpretations come, it's a very, very sad state of affairs. Because then the whole confidence that the public has on insurance companies will be lost. So it's better that these are all actually discussed and before you are actually buying a policy. So, limit of liability is there, uh, just uh, correct it to whatever figure, I think 2 door 250, you Google it, you will know it. Uh, otherwise, you just put it as 2 door 250 course or 22.5 billion. Facts support beyond pool available in the international market. So, it's quite possible that there are very large risks. When there are la very large risks, where this limit is not enough, then you can buy it from the Lloyd's market, you will have terrorism capacity that will be available. So you had a terrorism pool I talked about. I said there was a standalone coverage, political violence as well as terrorism and sabotage. Pool rates and terms of coverage are as for the uh, agreed terms of the pool. Terrorism losses in India, Mumbai was the main loss that actually occurred as far as terrorism is concerned. Uh, there is another loss which is not related to the pool, uh, which is basically a uh, India has some leftist uh, a terror organization called Naxalites. Uh, they had blown up one, uh, one pipeline uh, which was supplying slurry to a steel plant 200 kilometers away. It was in Orissa. Uh, this was not covered under the pool. It was covered as a standalone terrorism policy uh, where there was a loss of property damage of only uh, 1 million rupees. But uh, the loss of profits was almost 10 billion rupees. 10 billion rupees. Uh, that was because if you are transporting slurry in a pipeline and the pipeline is not there, you have to transport slurry in transport trucks and other things, your increased cost of working will be very, very high, so your profit will drastically come down. So that is something that has led, and there was a huge uh, disruption. So it was a very small loss, but a huge loss of profits loss that happened. Uh, it's uh, not been paid, it's under dispute. Uh, but fundamentally, that's nothing to do with the pool. If you talk about pool losses, this was the main pool loss that has been suffered. Others are all very small losses that you can talk about. I mean, clear? So this in general is about the, yeah. And uh, as I told you, damage due to police or security force action, you need to make it clear whether it's covered or not covered. Otherwise, it can always land up in dispute, whether it's a, uh, then it becomes an interpretation. <laughs> Next thing is on spontaneous combustion. So out of all the, uh, all the various uh, perils that are there, uh, we just uh, looked at uh, terrorism cover in uh, greater detail. Now let's look let's at spontaneous combustion. So if you remember, spontaneous combustion or spontaneous ignition is a type of combustion which occurs by self-heating. Increasing temperatures due to exothermic internal, internal reactions. Exothermic always means release of energy. Followed by thermal runaway, self-heating which rapidly accelerates high temperatures and finally outer ignition. Normal standard policy it excludes it, but if you buy an add-on peril, that's covered as an add-on peril. Can be better bought as an add-on peril. And normally in India, all the goods have been categorized from two four categories. Category one is the lowest hazard. Category four is the highest hazard. For those of you who are interested to know about the list of goods which fall under category 1, category 2, category 3, category 4, you can just Google it in the what is known as an insurance information bureau, IIB site. You have the fire tariff, 
all India, it's called AIFT, All India Fire Tariff. If you look at it, all the list of all the goods that are there is available. What falls into category one? And if you have any of those goods, it is preferable that this add-on cover is bought for spontaneous combustion. So from a spontaneous combustion point of view, the key is what is the definition? How do you categorize them? And how do you price them? The lowest price will be for category one, highest price will be for category four risk. Examples of category one are castor oil, bagas, category two are cocoa bean, cotton, cotton seed oil, category three is coal tar and oil cotton, and category four, the four is your coal, sponge iron and other things come under the category four risk. Have a clear idea? So we have covered the entire extensions that are possible. Now let us get into the exclusions. What are the as I told you, fire is a name parent policy. In a name parent policy, it's not very, very important to know what is excluded because everything is excluded. Only what is covered is what has been stated as perils. So nothing else is covered. But still, to ensure that there is a clarity, there is no doubt. You re-emphasize some of the things which are also obvious. So what are some of the important exclusions? Always in any policy as we discussed, excess or the deductible that you talk about is something, the first amount of money which the insured has to bear for himself, that is not covered, that is an exclusion under the policy. In India it is 10,000 rupees which is a very, very small amount for a fire risk and for act of God risk it is something 5% of the claim amount subject to minimum of 10,000. So that is how it has been given but that the number is not important. More important is the concept that you need to ensure that the very, very small risks are excluded by having a decent level of excess that is there as a part of the policy. The second thing is war a standard peril which is excluded in most policies. Though I told you political violence cover, it also includes war and war-like operations, but otherwise most standard policies will exclude the war, war-like operations, civil war and other things. So that's an exclusion. Similarly, <laughs> nuclear perils will be excluded from most of the policies. The next thing is pollution and contamination. As I said, always your loss or damage has to be sudden. Usually pollution, contamination is a slowly developing thing. So all those things are not standard coverage as under this fire policy. Specified items under this unless agreed. Some of the items are specified in the policy. These are like, for example, cash, bullion, jewelry, work of art. These are all not standard coverage. That means unless you have specifically mentioned that I am covering a MFO sale art piece which costs 10 million Indian rupees and the insurance company has agreed otherwise you can't even if there is a loss of damage you cannot tell me that is covered because you are not specifically included in the for example you can't say I had cash of 1 million rupees in my home the fire occurred and the fire damage please pay me you can cover it provided the insurance company has specifically agreed for it. So there are certain things like cash, jewelry or gold and other things, diamonds or your piece of work of art, all of these are not standard coverages under the <laughs> The next thing is change in temperature. As I told you in the cold storages, you can have a change in temperature but it is not necessary in cold storages. In any of the <coughs> material, if suddenly temperature changes, the material may get spoiled, that is not usually covered as a part of your standard policy. <coughs> there is another very very important exclusion called electrical exclusion. Electrical exclusion basically means any loss or damage which occurs due to either electrical short circuiting or overloading or arcing that you talk about will not be covered under a fire policy. To just give an example, if this is a tube light, in this tube light there is a short circuiting. Because of the short circuit, the tube light burns out. And it not only burns out, the fire spreads to everything. Now, as per the electrical exclusion, the tube light will not be covered, but the fire that has spread, which has damaged and other things, will all be covered under the policy. Now, why is 
only the tubulite not covered because normally the, this is called the internal fire. These internal fires are electric or electrical fires are subject matter of what is known as machinery insurance insurance. Machinery insurance or machinery breakdown insurance. There is an engineering insurance called machinery breakdown insurance or machinery insurance, which is what is covered under your MI policy. Since that is the coverage that should have been taken under MI policy, it is not covered under your fire policy. But the consequent fire stands covered. So anything because of short circuiting RP. The example I gave you is about a tube light, which may cost may not be much, but imagine if it's a big motor or a big transformer or a big turbine where the fire started, you are not going to pay that also unless you had covered it under machine reinsurance. As far as standard fire policy is concerned, that is not covered because they are all internal fires, internal fires of your electrical or mechanical breakdown, which is subject matter of your machine reinsurance. So that is called the electrical exclusion. Next exclusion is called loss of earnings, delay, market share, consequential losses. As I told you, no policy covers the property policy, covers your consequential losses. You have a business interruption policy, which is a separate policy, but as far as the property damage policy is concerned, it does not cover. You cannot say this fire has resulted in a damage. Because of the damage, I was shut down. Because I was shut down, I lost an order because of which I lost so much money, so please pay me. That is not a subject matter of your property policy. These are all consequential damages. You want to cover it, there is a separate policy related to that, means business interruption. When we speak about business interruption, I will tell you what are the coverages, what are the limitations as well that is concerned, but suffice to tell you that material damage policy does not cover consequential losses. The next thing is cessation of work violation. Many a times I told you, it's quite possible that a worker may not damage anything as a striker. He may just switch off one button. He knows that if you switch off that button, the material inside will get spoiled and cause you a huge amount of damage. Usually that is not covered as a, because it's a exclusion, which is cessation of work related to spoilage. The next thing is theft. Again, it's a fire policy, it's not a burglary or theft policy, so it's not covered, but still to make it very clear, theft is an exclusion that has been given policy. The next thing is for property mood for more than 60 days. If you move the property, even if you have a temporary mode of stocks, more than other things, for more than 60 days, any property that will move, it doesn't get covered under the fire policy. So these are few of the exclusions that are part of the fire policy. Another area that you need to understand is something called long-term policies for home. Normally, as you know, non-life insurance policies are one-year policies. But there are exceptions like your project insurance, which is, can be long-term or short-term, depending upon the size of the project. But within property policies, usually the homes that we buy, Usually you take a loan from the bank and buy those prop homes. So when you buy a home, for example, I buy a flat, I take a loan from a bank. The bank will give a 10-year or 15-year or 20-year loan to me. Now suppose the property gets damaged, who will suffer? The insured will suffer, but the bank also will suffer because the insured, because it's damaged, may not be in a condition to pay back the loan and the interest that he has taken from the bank. So that's the reason why banks insist that all the things which are bought, which are there, which all the property which where loan has been taken, they are covered under your fire policy. So when they insist that, they don't want this headache of every year renewing that policy. That means I take a policy now, the loan is for 15 years, every year they have to remember the renewal and then renew it. So they want a long term policy. Normally insurance companies give for homes, they normally don't give it, but only for homes where loan is involved, where the bank's interest is involved. In those cases, you give long term policies for home. It can be 15 year policies, 20 year policies, 25 year policies also. Wherein you are paying the premium. It's not a big thing because from the loan amount directly the premium also will be deducted 
and then paid by the bank to the to the insurance company. The client may not even know. He may be just a signed it. This is money, but the bank would have already paid it and uh, taken its commission out of it. But this is a long term policy that is given. So in India, these long term policies may be 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. There are certain rules related to long term policies. So if there is any question related to long term policies, you need to understand these rules. What are these rules? The rules say long term policies should be issued based on either of the following two methods. There are two methods by which you can give. Subject to the conditions. What are the conditions? The minimum for time period for which you will be giving is three years. You can't give giving for less than three years. Long term policy. Second condition is no refund shall be allowed for midterm cancellation of such policies. That means once you have taken a policy, again it's a contractual thing, but this is the rules that are applicable in India. Don't assume that the same rules will be applicable somewhere outside India. But as far as rule India is concerned, you don't give a refund if there is midterm cancellation. Midterm inclusion of peril shall not be allowed. For example, if you have covered a fire policy, you not at the starting you did not buy earthquake extension. After five years, you are not allowed to buy earthquake. Midterm inclusion of a peril will not be. If you want to buy earthquake also, buy it at the starting, but not in between. That is what is the rule over it. The next thing is premium for the entire policy period shall be collected in advance. That means every year you are not given installment facility. The entire premium will be collected at the starting. Mainly for administrative convenience because the bank is going to give the loan from the loan they will direct it, give it off at one go. Now, when you collect in advance, I hope all of you understand, the insurance company will earn an invest investment income. Is it not? So, you should give a discount. Because if I pay a premium every year, if I am paying X into 10 years, for 10 years, it should be 10X. But if I am giving the entire 10X at the starting, I hope all of you will agree that 10X I can invest and make some money as an insurance company. So, I should not charge 10x, I should charge 9x or 8x, some discount I have to give them. So what are the rules related to that? What they say is, there are, there are two methods, one is called method A, other is called method B. In method A, the premium should be charged in full, that is no discount will be given. Without giving any discount, however, sum insured on the policy shall be deemed to have increased by 10% of the original sum insured at the end of every 12 months. That means every year the sum insured will increase by 10%. So you are not giving a discount, but if today sum insured is 100 million, sorry 10 million, then next year it will be 10 million plus 10% 10 of 10 million will be 11 million. The next year will be 12.12 million or 12.1? 12.1 you are saying you are 12. Who is right? Both of you argue and decide. Sir, 11 into 10 percent. So he is right. He is right. 11 percent is 1.1. So 2.1. He is right. But I will say you are right. Not he is wrong. So now tell me. Yes. The word, that's why every word has the importance. It's not just because you know a compound interest formula, you don't need to apply it. You have to see what he's saying. He's saying original submission. Original submission was only 10 million. So every year, 10% of the original submission will increase. So like a simple interest, every year it will be only 1 million increase. So 10, 11, 12 and all that. That is how it is going to increase. So this is one method. One method, first method, what are you doing? I don't give discount, but it increases sum insured every year. Second option is, I don't increase sum insured. The sum insured for the full loan period, 15 years, 10 years, will be the same. It will not change. But, please understand, that is, because I am taking the premium in advance, I am going to give a specific discount. That discount is given in a table which is not important what the table is. More important is that there is a method by which for a 5 year policy, 10 year policy, 6 year policy, you give a particular amount of discount that you give in the premium. So that is the two methods that are applied as far as long term policies are concerned. Is this clear to all of you? Next important thing is that there are some special policies for stocks. The fire policy that you give, 
policies, special policies. I, it's a wrong word to use special policies. There are special clauses that are applicable for the for policy will still be fire policy. In a fire policy, if you understand, there are some peculiar features as far as stocks are concerned. Stocks usually keep on varying on a regular basis. Is it not? For example, my stock position today, in this, if this is a warehouse, today it may be 1 million. Tomorrow, if there is a lot of demand in Hyderabad, the guy may increase his stock position from 1 million to 5 million. After two months, if the demand goes down, for example, for Christmas, there is a huge demand, he will increase. Then there will be a lean period. He will reduce his stock. So, sometimes there may be real stock. So, your stock may be 0, it can be 1, it can be 5 million. It keeps on varying. Now, the question that comes up is, the stock is keeping on varying. What is the sum insured that I should consider? Should I consider 0? Should I consider 1? Average of that? Should I consider the highest of that? The answer should be, you should always consider the highest because you do not know when the loss is going to occur. Is it not? You don't know when the loss, loss can occur when my stocks are at the peak. And usually Murphy's law says that when things are going wrong, they will go very bad. So, when your stocks are very high, that's the time you may have a fire. So, I should be covering it for the full sum insured. That is the highest value at any point of time in the year is what I should be covering. Now, if that is the case, the insured will certainly feel that hardly one or two days my stock will be at that position. But you are charging me a premium for the entire year as if the stocks are lying like that. So to take care of that special property, insurance companies give a declaration facility. What is this declaration facility? They will say that every month you can, you can insure it for the highest value. I will charge you a premium for the highest value. But every month you declare me the value, either the average value or the highest value, whatever is agreed, or the value of the last day of the month, whatever is the method which is agreed, you declare me the value. At the end of the year, I will take the average of all the values. I will recalculate the premium. Whatever additional premium I have taken, I will refund you back that particular premium. This is called as a declaration facility. Am I clear here? So if the question is related to declaration facility, again there are certain rules in India, you need to understand what are those rules. So your stocks can be given either a declaration facility before we get into the rules of declaration facility. Another concept that I will bring in is the concept called the floater policy. The second important thing, I told you stocks can keep on varying. But another important element that you have to understand is that stocks have another feature that I keep on shifting the stocks. Suppose I have a warehouse in Hyderabad, I have a warehouse in Chennai, I have a warehouse in Delhi. If there is a huge demand, I will shift stocks from Hyderabad to Delhi if the demand is high in Delhi. If after two months the demand in Chennai is high, I will shift from Delhi to Chennai. My overall stocks position I may know, but I don't know when, at which location the stocks will be at what level. Am I clear here? So, to take care of this problem, you give what is known as a floater facility. You would have come across float, family floater in health policy. What do you do in a family floater in health policy? If I have a family of four, all of us are covered under one sum insured. Similarly, if there are three warehouses, all the three warehouses will be covered under one single sum insured. Please understand that fire insurance is a location specific policy. You are supposed to give the address of every location, you are supposed to give sum insured of every location. But when you give a floater facility, you are allowing him that leeway that he doesn't need to give me sum insured of every location. He can give me the total sum insured of all the locations put together and the addresses of each of the locations. Then I will be covering it as if the entire thing has been covered. So that his stocks can keep on varying from one location to other location. It's only for stocks, right? It's only for stocks. Because building and machinery, you will not have this problem. Yeah, so for those things, the price of insured will be yeah, for 
building and machinery, there is no floater facility, no declaration facility. You have to give your location address, you have to give your building value, machinery value. Only for stocks, also you should give it. But if you opt for these clauses, if you have special facilities like declaration facility or floater facility or also called floater declaration facility, then you will get that facility wherein you don't need to declare the stock at each particular location. Have a clear? So, let us look at the rules. These rules are only applicable in India, may not necessarily be outside India, but from an examination point of view, you need to understand what those rules are. So, minimum sum insured is one, one million, uh, 10 million rupees at one location. If you want to give a declaration policy, the minimum sum insured, that means you don't want to give it for small, small policies, you need to have a minimum sum insured of 10 million at one or more locations, and INR 2.5 million at at least one location. Declared value should approximate to those figures during the policy year. Monthly declarations can be given. It can either be the average of each day of the month or highest value during the month. One of these two methods are to be used. Declarations to be received by the last day of the succeeding month. If not received, full summit should be considered. That means if you are saying the May declaration should be received by 30th June. June declaration should be received by 31st July. If you don't give it, then we will consider full sum insured as your declaration. So that is what has to be considered. Next thing is reduction in sum insured is not allowed. Because you are giving a declaration facility and referring the premium, there is no reason why you have to refer, reduction, reduce this premium sum insured. So reduction of sum insured is not allowed under this policy. Refund not to exceed 50% of the premium, original premium. That means maximum refund I will give is 50%. That means even if the stock's average is more less than 50%, I am not going to give him full deal refund. I will restrict my refund to only 50%. Next thing is basis of value of declaration to be market value. As you know, the stocks usually are declared on market value. So we will understand slightly later what market value and uh, statement value is, but at this stage, understand stocks are always on a market value basis, so it will be market value. Declaration policy not to be issued for short period policies, that's your annual policy. Stocks undergoing process, you don't give it. Stocks at railway sidings, you don't give a declaration policy. Under issues to apply for under declaration. It's quite possible that a client in order to get a highest refund, May keep on, though his stock position is different, he will keep on declaring very, very low values. So what will happen is when a claim comes, that guy will be penalized twice. One is for under insurance, second is for under declaration. So that is the how, that's the way you protect yourself as an insurance company from the under declaration that is possible. These are the rules as far as declaration policy are concerned. Am I clear here? Any doubts on this? Next is the floater policy rules. So floater policy, stocks at various locations are covered under one sum insured. Unspecified locations are not allowed. Again, outside India they are allowed, but mostly in India, as per the rules, you cannot give un you cannot say stocks lying anywhere in India. You are giving allowing them to declare one sum insured, that is fine, but you cannot you have to give the address of every location. That means Mumbai, what is the address? Chennai, what is the address? Hyderabad, what is the address? Delhi, what is the address? Calcutta, what is the address? You have to give the entire thing. Unspecified means you are saying anywhere in Telangana, anywhere in India, anywhere in Asia. That is all not allowed. Unspecified locations are not allowed in a detection form, in a protocol. Next thing is rate. How do you charge the rate? Because every location will have a separate rate because where is another risk. So what they are saying is, you have to look at if more than one locations are covered in the photo policy, which it is, you need to look at which location has the highest rate, take that highest rate and give and load it by 10%, that rate you have to apply as far as photo policy is concerned. If process block rate is highest, same to be applied. Sometimes stocks may be lying in the process block itself. So if you are covering the process block stocks also into the different into the floater facility, then you have to get the floater if the process block rate is higher, you will be charging the higher rate as far as concerned. And finally, 
stocks within a compound. Sometimes, if this is one compound, I may have three different godons. One may be raw material godon, one may be finished good godon, one may be stocks in the process godon. If they are within the same compound, then you don't need to charge the 10% extra that you talked about. Total extra need not be charged if they are stocks located in the same compound. These are the few rules as far as total policies are concerned. So these are applicable, as I said, only for stocks. Right? And if you combine both, that means I give a declaration facility, I also give a floater facility. Then it becomes a floater declaration. So what are the rules for floater declaration? Floater declaration, minimum sum insured is INR 20 million. Rules for both floater and declaration policies to be followed. And minimum retention is 80% of the premium. That means in a floater, in a declaration policy you said, maximum refund 50%. That means minimum retention of 50%. Here, minimum retention is 80%. That means maximum refund I am going to give is only 20%. I am not going to give more than 20% refund if it is a floater declaration policy. Again, not very important from your practical purpose because your country will have your own rules. It need not be applicable there. But from an examination perspective, if there are some questions related to rules, then you need to be giving these specific rules. Am I clear here? Now, let us look at what is the property to be insured. Usually we classify all the, because you don't, in a fire policy, you don't say chair number one, this value, chair number two, this value, table number one, you don't cover like that. You say block, process block, powerhouse, boiler house, office block, like that you cover the blocks and within the blocks you broadly divide it into building, plant and machinery, stocks, stocking process. So that is the usual classification that you give or one more you can give what is known as furniture fixture fitting. So you can broadly classify as building, plant and machinery, furniture fixture fittings and stocks and stocks and process. So this is a broad classification that you do whenever you are covering any, any of the uh, assets that are covered under a fire policy. So that means usually it is block wise, you don't split the block into this machine, that machine. You say block, process block, all the machines this value. All the, the building cost this much. The stocks and stocking process this much. Furniture fixture fittings this much. That is how you classify them whenever you are covering them under a fire box. Right? Now we get into, we have covered the entire fire policy. Now we just transport into ourselves into the industrial office policy. Any questions before you get into IAR policy? Any portions related to fire policy? No? Yeah, I want to know. please. It's also an office policy. What is a package policy? Package policy is you are covering different products under one single policy. That is what a package policy is. <laughs> one thing you have to remember in an indirect in the, uh, in the industrial orders is a fact in most insurance policies is that the property insured must suffer real, direct and permanent physical damage or destruction. So that is something that is very, very crucial. It has to be direct. It has to be permanent physical loss or damage. Permanent does not mean that you cannot repair it. Permanent only means that, for example, there is something like a rubber ball. You, you press it, it loses shape and it comes back to shape. It is not permanent damage. Something that can automatically come back, it is not a permanent damage. So please understand that it has to be direct damage. It has to be physical damage. Sometimes there may be mental damage. Sometimes, because of other things, we may have a mental loss. We have a mental pain that you are getting related. This are not covered under, though it's an always policy, you can't claim that I had a mental agony because of which pain me under the IR policy. It has to be physical damage. So it has to be direct, it has to be physical, it has to be real. It can be an imaginary loss that you are talking about. 
Second thing is location of the policy to be clearly specified. Though it's an always policy or basic requirement for a property policy, it's a location specific policy. So which location you are covering has to be clearly specified in the policy. <coughs> Next thing is the damage to the property must be un accidental and unforeseeable. Something that you are able to foresee, something that you are able to expect, usually is not a subject matter of an insurance policy. It has to be unforeseeable and it has to be an accidental thing. It can't be intentionally happening, it has to be accidentally happening. And last thing is, damage must be sudden as against gradual slope. As we as I kept, kept on saying in a fire policy, we don't cover slowly developing flaws, slowly developing things. It has to be sudden damage, sudden loss of damage. That is what is covered. So damage must be sudden, against a gradual or slow action. So it has to be sudden damage that we talk about. Now what are the sections? In the Indian industrial office policy, section 1 is your material damage section. It is equivalent to your fire policy, but it's not right to say fire policy because fire policy is an all is a neighboring policy, whereas this is an all risk policy. So it is basically everything is covered other than exclusions. So for you, for understanding sake, it's equivalent to a fire policy, but it is much beyond it because it's an all risk policy. And it's important thing to, for you to understand in this material damage section, you also cover some of the engineering policies. Engineering policies like machinery insurance, <coughs> boiler pressure plant insurance, electronic equipment insurance, all of them are also covered under section 1 material damage. Right? Second thing is section 2, which is business interruption. So you have a material damage section and a business interruption section. Now when you buy the entire gamut of things, it covers fire and allied perils, it covers burglary, it covers machinery breakdown, it covers boiler pressure plant insurance, covers electronic equipment insurance, it covers fire loss of profits or business interruption fire and specific perils, it also covers machinery loss of profits. But as far as India is concerned, while fire coverage is compulsory, machinery coverage is compulsory, Fire loss of profits is compulsory, machinery loss of profits is optional. That means the client can decide whether he wants to cover MLOP or he does not want to cover. Other three things are standardized coverages which are part of the IR policy. Second important thing is normally when you buy engineering insurance or machinery insurance, you can decide which machine you want to cover. That means if there are 10 machines, I don't need to cover all the machines under machine reinsurance. I can cover only one machine or two machines which are more prone to damage. Whereas when you take a fire policy, you have to cover everything. Similar in IR policy, even for the machine reinsurance section, you do not have an option. You have to cover all the machinery together. So these are some of the features as far as an IR policy is concerned. So it's a package of various policies that are there. Machinery loss of profits is an optional cover. In India, declaration facility used to be there even in IR policy. They have withdrawn that particular uh, facility, uh, not necessarily for you, you people. You cannot still give a declaration policy outside India for IR policy. Nothing wrong with it, but fundamentally it has been withdrawn over here. Building furniture, fixture fittings, and plant and machinery only on RIV basis. RIV basis means reinstatement value basis. That means you cannot cover the IAR policy under market value basis. Now, please understand fire policy usually is on market value basis. Whereas, IAR policy can only be on reinstatement value basis. Fire policy, if you add a reinstatement value clause, then it will be on reinstatement value clause. Otherwise, the standard policy is on it market value basis. Now just for your understanding, you need to understand what is a market value, what is a reinstatement value. Did I tell you already? Last class? No. Okay. So what I will do is, both the government or the government. And suppose it is completely lost or damaged. I should only be replacing it with a 5 year old machinery. I can't give you a new machine. 
But will you get a five year old machine? You can't buy it from the market, five year old machine. Exactly five years, three days machine, I can't buy it. Just because I need So I will always buy a new machine. But when you pay a claim on a market value basis, you will allow him to buy a new machinery, but from that new machinery value, you will take out depreciation and pay him a new replacement value minus depreciation. So, market value is, please understand, in insurance, there is a very standard meaning for market value. It means new replacement value or so called as reinstatement value minus depreciation. New replacement value minus depreciation. And how do you calculate depreciation? Depreciation is calculated using a straight line method. What is the straight line method? It's basically what is the life, what is the age. Is this clear to all of you? So, for example, to just give you an example, suppose this building is 5 years old. Okay? All of you note it now. This building is 5 years old. The life of this building is 50 years. Okay? Life is 50 years. Life is how long this will last? It's 50 years. This building, five years back, I constructed it for 10 million. That means in 2015, 2014, this building was constructed, it costed me 10 million. Okay? If I have to build the same building today, it costs me 15 million. If I have to build the same building today, it costs me 15 million. What is this 15 million called? This 15 million is a new is called a new replacement value. That means the old building I have to replace today. Same, same structure, same design, same uh, construction features is going to cost me. That is called a new replacement value. Okay? So 15 million is a new replacement value. Now, if you want to know the market value, market value we said is a new replacement value minus depreciation. So what I should do? New replacement value is 15 minus depreciation I told you should be applied on a straight line method. Straight line method means what is the age divided by what is the life? What is the age of this machine? 5. What is the life of this machine? 50. So 5 by 50. 5 by 50 is how much? 1 by 10 or 10 percent. Okay? It is 5 by 50 into the new replacement value of 50. I hope all of you know why 15 happened. Is because depreciation should be on today's value. New replacement value. So new replacement is 15. So this is 15 minus 10 percent of 15. That is nothing but 15 minus 1.5. Is this clear at all? Yes. So when you talk about reinstatement value, reinstatement value of this building is 15 million. When somebody is asking you market value, the market value of this building is 13.5 million. We are least bothered about the 10 million. What he spent money on to arrive at that is of no consequence because I have nothing to do with what he spent 5 years back because if loss occurs, I have to do it today. I have to replace it today. How much it costed 5 years back has no significance. I have to pay him today's cost. That's the reason why we always look at either a market value or a restatement value. Normally, standard fire policy only gives on market value. So, if this building is completely lost or damaged, 
as long as the maturity is adequate, I am only going to pay him 13 point Suppose he has taken a fire pulse in a restated value clause. How much out of paid? Out of paid is 15 million. 13.5 is a indemnity principle. He has lost a five-year-old building. I am giving a value of a five-year-old building because I have taken out depreciation. Restated value clause, when you add it, it becomes what is known as a modified indemnity. You are modifying the indemnity principle and you are saying you are giving new for old. When old is lost, new is given. When I am saying new, it doesn't mean I am giving better. There is a difference between better and new. For example, I am covering a machine. The machine, 5 year old machine or a 10 year old machine of Kirloskar make of 5 HP motor, 5 HP motor. I am only going to give him a 5 HP motor. If you cannot get a better machine, if you get a better machine, a more efficient machine, then I will deduct the claim for betterment. All I am doing is, the same machine, instead of giving you an old machine, I am giving you a new machine. That is called as a reinstatement value, also called as new replacement value. Is this concept clear to all of you? Yes. So your market value and a reinstatement value, original purchase price has no significance, what we are bothered about is, is it reinstated value? What it only thing that you have to remember is, you are buying a policy on a particular day. The policy will run for one more year. The loss can occur any time in the future. Whereas, I will be able to calculate the, these values before I buy the insurance. So, you have to add something towards inflation for the next one year. So, that is what you do as a as a policy. When we discuss about escalation clause, I will discuss slightly more about it. But at this stage, suffice for you to understand how you arrive at market value, how you arrive at real estate. This is clear to all of you. If this is clear to all of you, please understand, fire policy is always on a market value basis. But fire policy has a clause known as reinstatement value clause. If a client adds a reinstatement value clause, then the policy becomes on a reinstatement value. Otherwise, it's on a market When you add a reinstatement value clause, you are giving new for old. If you don't add a reinstatement value clause, you are giving old for old. That means, whatever been the old machine, I am going to replace equivalent value of an old machine, not the new machine. This is the basic difference. Remember, this market value and reinstatement value concepts are mainly for building and condemnation. As far as stock is concerned, there is nothing like a replacement value or reinstatement value. It's always on a market value basis. So, if you are talking about building reinstatement value and market value, it's only for building and condemnation or foundation fixation, not for stocks. So, as far as stocks are concerned, it's always on a market value basis. Is this clear? So, what I wanted to tell you is that fire policy, standard fire policy is on a market value with a possibility of attaching a reinstatement value clause. There is an IR policy, there is no option of market value, it is always on a reinstatement value clause. So, that is the basic difference between the fire policy valuation and the reinstatement value policy valuation. Second thing, you may be thinking I may be charging because I am giving in a reinstatement value policy, new policy for old, sorry, new machine for old, new building for old, I may be charging extra premium. Please don't you please don't you don't charge any extra rate. But when you declare a value in a market value, your submission should, should represent market value. When you are attacking a reinstatement value, your submission should, should represent reinstatement value. So automatically, reinstatement value will be more than market value. So the, even the rate is same, premium will be more. That is how you get more premium in a reinstatement value clause attached. But rate does not change. Only the premium will increase because your sum should will automatically increase if you are choosing a reinstatement value clause. Is this clear to all of you? No. So in this case, then the 10 million bidding should be uh, Insured for some insured of 15 million. If it is, if it is attaching a RIV class, if it is attaching a, if it is not attaching a RIV class, you should attach it insured for 13.5 million. Suppose he insured it for 10 million. 
because it's valuable, he bought it. Then what we'll do is, when a claim comes, you will see whether it is a market value policy or a RIV policy. If it's a market value policy, you will apply under insurance say 10 divided by 13.5. If it's a reinstated value policy, we will say 10 divided by 15. So many of people have a fashion of attending an RIV policy, RIV clause, without actually increasing the sum insured. Then they will suffer very much in under insurance. So when you, see, when you do it on a RIV basis, your sum insured should also represent RIV because you have to pay me premium based on RIV. You can't pay me premium based on market value and expect me to pay your claim based on RIV. And that's the reason why you need to ensure that your sum insured exactly represents your each statement. Am I clear here? So why we went into this, though we'll again uh, come back to this particular area, why we went into this is, uh, because IAR policy is based on a RIV only, whereas fire policy is based on market value or RIV, market value on a standard basis, but when you attach a uh, class, RIV class, it's on a RIV class. So coming back to it, building furniture fixtures, plant and machine on RIV basis, and as I told you, stock will always be on a market value basis. Now, any question? So now when we talk about IR policy, as I told you, it's an all-risk policy. In an all-risk policy, exclusions become very important. Because everything is covered other than exclusions. So what are these exclusions? Exclusion number one is faulty or defective design or workmanship, inherent vice, gradual deterioration, deformation, distortion or wear and tear. All of these are exclusions under the standard IAM policy. As you know, design defect, faulty workmanship, all of them are not covered. They are professional liability things. Whoever has done it, whoever is a the manufacturer, they are, should be responsible for it. IAM policy will not cover this. Second thing is interruption of water supply, gas supply, electricity, or failure of effluent systems and from premises. Unless damage by a cause not included in the policy, ensures and then the insurance will be liable only for ensuring damage. So fundamentally, again, any loss or damage that has occurred because of your electricity has been cut off, your, power, your gas supply has been cut off, your water supply has been cut off, is not a part of this particular policy. Unless because of one of the insured perils or what I mean, what is not excluded, your gas, suppose because of fire your transformer is damaged because of the air supply surface, it is covered. But not just because transformer has failed, which is not covered, you are going to get a cover under this particular policy. Similarly, collapse or cracking of buildings are not covered as a part of the IAR policy in India. Many countries collapse and cracking of buildings are covered after an initial few years they are covered. But as far as India is concerned, this policy, IAR policy, collapse and cracking of buildings is not covered. Why is it not covered? Fundamentally because you are not so sure about how, uh, how much importance or has been given to design. In the sense, uh, Design will be one and actual construction will be one. Uh, so that's the reason why you don't want this normal cracks and other things to be covered. But otherwise, you can, if you are confident that the governmental authorities are very strict, that if I give, if I submit a plan, design plan, and I submit and I exactly construct based on that. And I hope all of you know in India what you give to the government authorities and what you construct will be completely different. So there's no meaning to it. So that's the reason why you don't necessarily are not confident about it, but otherwise it's a it's basically it can be covered, not a big big age. Corrosion, rust, extremes or changes in temperature, fungus, pollution, contamination, vermin, insects, all of them are not covered. That means loss or damage due to these are not covered. Theft is not covered. Acts of fraud or dishonesty are not covered. Inventory loss or unexplained disappearance is not covered. Inventory loss fundamentally means any loss that you notice is during the inventory taking process. When I'm find, I take an inventory, last year there were 30 chairs, today when I take an inventory it's only 25 chairs, I don't know how those 5 chairs went away, I can't claim for the insurance company, it's an inventory loss. But if you know 
what is the reason for that loss and it's covered in that you can do it but not as an inventory taking process normal state of street settlement or bending down of new structures so when new structure just suddenly goes down because soil is not proper it is not part of the policy willful act or willful negligence cessation of work delay or loss of market or any other consequential or indirect loss political risk terrorism war destruction by order of public authority so if the public authority says municipal authority says we have to destroy this building that is not part of the particular coverage any restriction on reconstruction or operation imposed by any public authority this is sufficient lack of funds we are covering a business interruption policy also an ir policy just because you don't have funds you are not able to construct and because of which you are suffering a loss that will not be covered under the insurance policy that will be the responsibility of the insured to ensure that there are adequate funds to rebuild them other than that what we have studied is the excluded uh, perils other than that there is something called excluded property some property are usually not covered under the policy what are those property money as i told you so special like money checks credit cards bonds precious stones work of art bullion unless you are specifically mentioning that and covering it otherwise standard policy will not cover any of this good sending trust business books computer records malls plants unless specifically mentioned and covered we are not covered next thing is vehicles license for road use you should cover it under motor insurance they are not covered under fire policy property in transit outside outside premises covered under marine policy not under ir policy property during demolition erection construction not covered and as you know land usually is not a subject matter of coverage just to give an example for example you are having a flat in mumbai which may be 20 million indian rupees i hope all of you know that when a loss is going to occur nothing is going to go happen to the land If a fire occurs, earthquake occurs, will your land go away? Nothing. Your flat is along with your flat, you have a portion of the undivided land. You are the owner of the undivided land. That is why you are paying two two twenty million rupees for that particular flat. When a loss or damage occurs, you are not going to lose twenty million. You will only lose the cost of reconstructing it, which may be fifteen hundred rupees per square feet or two thousand per square feet, which may hardly go up to one million or two million. so it's no point in insuring for the value of the flat where land is also a part of the main part of the thing you only should be insuring for the cost of construction of the flat because nothing is going to happen to the land usually land need not be covered as a part of your policy even in fire policy i didn't tell you but clinton foundation usually is not covered you can cover it but usually you don't expect any loss or damage to clinton foundation in a fire but even an earthquake occurs your clinton foundation can also be affected so you can cover clinton foundation for earthquake and not cover under fire so these are some things intricate things that you can do when you are covering a particular policy so land is also not covered livestock group crops trees all of them are subject matter of crop insurance so you cannot be covered under ir property damage result of undergoing any process not covered property undergoing testing repair alteration not, not covered property removed to other location except machinery equipment temporarily removed for 60 days property insured under marine policy is not covered as in a fire policy marine policy will be the one which will take precedence and in ir policy one very very important thing noted down is something called as a special condition of average special condition of average your book talks about 75% actually it is 85% you don't write whatever your book talks or uh, what is right that's okay in the exam but note special condition of average means normally what does condition of average say condition of average tells you that if there is under 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 insurance and condition of average means the same thing if there is an under insurance that means if my value for value of your property is 100 you are insuring it for 90 then it is believed that you are your own insurer for 10 so when a claim occurs i am only going to pay 90% the remaining 10% you have to bear yourself that is what under insurance means special condition of average means that up to a particular percentage you waive off under insurance 
usually in IR policy it is 85 percent. That means up to 15 percent under insurance you are going to waive off under insurance. That means if you are 100 rupee, 100, 100 Indian rupee value property, you are insuring for 85. I am not going to penalize you for any under insurance because there is a special condition of coverage. What if it is you are insuring it for 84? Then I am going to penalize you for 16 percent, not extra 1 percent. I am going to penalize you for full 16 percent. So fundamentally, special condition of average means up to a particular percentage. In your book they talk about up to 25 percent, but usually in most policies it is 15 percent. 15 up to 15 percent, you are waived off. That means any under insurance 15 percent, we are not going to penalize you. We are going to treat as if you have no, there is no under insurance in your property. Am I right? Am I clear? So IAR policy has a special condition of average up to 85 percent. And as I told you, there is no market value basis in IR policy, compulsory it is a reinstated value basis. Yeah. The, this one last thing and then we shall break for tea. Yeah. So, uh, some insured at one location, uh, there is something called again a very typical Indian con concept called mega policy. Uh, I just put it because in case uh, somebody asks in the exam you need to know. So mega insurance, mega risk insurance fundamentally means that when they were, uh, one of our friends was saying in India there is a tariff wording. That is wording is not the tariff. Wording is also all standardized. But there are certain policies which are reinsurance driven. That means you know some insured is very large. In India you don't need to follow the standardized wording. You can create a reinsurance backed wording. So, what are the rules for that? If the sum insured of material damage from business description is more than 25 billion Indian rupees, 25 billion or 25,000 million Indian rupees, then a mega policy can be given. In mega policy, that wording and pricing will be reinsurance driven. You don't need to follow your standardized wording. You can use the own wording based on the negotiation that happens between the client and the insurer and the reinsurer. And for liability insurance, it's greater than uh, 1 billion. That is 100 process, 1000 million or 1 billion. Then you are again, you can have a mega policy. Rates, terms, conditions of cover may be determined with reference to the international markets. So basically, that the standardized wording need not be used. You can use international wordings as far as the value is more than this particular place. Everything can be negotiated. Yeah. So with this, we will stop for uh, now. Uh, then we get into practices after we come back for the break. Uh, it's quarter to three, we'll come back at three. Yeah. Uh, in the fire insurance or your property insurance. Uh, there are some things which are uh, basically uh, standard, not necessarily for fire insurance. Uh, first, we'll cover those areas. Uh, first is what are the components of an insurance policy? Uh, insurance policy will have a heading which identifies the class of policy. It will have a preamble which will say insured having signed the proposal form and paid premium, I promise to do this. The operative clause, it says the type of events insured against. Then the policy schedule which is the printed portion of it which will describe your sum insured, your location, your address, all that will be part of the schedule. And then finally the underwriter or the insurer is signing it. These are the various parts of a policy. And also other than that you will have definitions. Most policies will have definitions uh, because a lot of terms. Uh, insurance companies may be using it in their own, with its own special meaning. So it's very crucial that insurance companies define them. So definition is an important part of a policy. Not that your standard fire policy does not have definitions, but normally it's always better to have a definitions. The next thing is warranties. Warranties are things where you are, the insured is promising that a particular thing is there or it's not there. For example, you put a warranty, warranted that the electrical wiring is as per Indian standards. Then you are warranting that the insured is promising that all the electrical
vehicles or as per the standard that means conduit wiring is there, switches are proper, they are Indian standard make, so the stand, all that is being promised. Guaranteed that no petrol is stored here. That means he is saying that I am promising you that there will be no petrol stored in this petrol thing. If there is a breach of warranty, then the contract becomes voidable. That means the insurance company has a right to decline that particular claim or to void that particular contract. So that is what is a breach of contract. Even though it's not Yes. Please understand that it need not necessarily be that the loss or damage should be occurring because of breach of contract, breach of warranty. It's quite possible, I put a condition that in the IR policy that there is no petrol. But the damage is there because of a magnesium breakdown. Petrol putting there has nothing to do with, I can understand for the fire loss, it is related to that. But petrol putting there has nothing to do with your machinery breakdown. But when the surveyor goes there, he says petrol is there or photograph shows that petrol is there after during the time of loss. Then the insurance company has a right to void the contract. That means you can say as if contract has not been given. It's a different thing whether practically they will do it, they will take commercial calls, that's a different thing. It, they have a right as far as breach of warranty is concerned. So that's the importance as far as warranty is concerned. So it need not necessarily be related to the loss that actually happened. It may or may not be. Okay. The next thing is exclusions and the conditions. These are all parts of a policy. So if there is a question related to what is a uh, components of a policy, you need to write about the preamble, you need to write about the operator clause, all those things that we talked about. Heading, preamble, operator calls, policy schedule, the signature, definitions, warranties, then the exclusions and conditions. Okay. The next thing is what are conditions? Conditions can be express conditions or implied conditions. Express conditions you are giving in writing or in orally that this is what has to be done. Implied means it is basically implied. It's not been given but it's implied. So fundamentally, the express conditions or implied conditions. Implied conditions, subject matter of insurance actually exists. Insurable interest and all utmost good faith are all implied conditions. You don't need to tell that you are supposed to exhibit utmost good faith. You are not supposed, need not tell that the subject matter actually should exist. If it does that, I have a right. So basically these are all implied conditions. Whereas conditions, then there is something called conditions, conditions precedent to a contract. That means before a contract comes into picture, you need to have those conditions fulfilled. The conditions fulfilled prior to formulation of contract, implied conditions fall in this particular category. Whereas conditions subsequent to a contract, notification of alterations, that means if there is a change, then insured is duty bound to inform the insurer this is a consequence to the contract, he is, this condition is applicable. So for division, conditions can be before the contract or after the contract. And then contingents precedent to liability, it can be related to claims. For example, if I have to pay in the claim, I may put a condition that he has to inform me about the claim within two days or three days or one week. That's considered related to the claims. That is a condition related to the claims. If he has not informed me, after one month he is coming to me and telling me a claim had occurred one month back, I have a right to repudiate the particular claim. So this is related to the liability of the particular claim. And then what is a warranty? A warranty is either a clause requiring an insured to undertake to do or not to do a certain thing or a clause related to existence or absence of certain state of affairs. So I already gave you examples of a warranty. Warranty to be strictly complied. Breach of warranty, contract voidable from the time of breach. The moment the breach has occurred, contract can be voidable. Who can void it? The innocent party can void it. Who is the innocent party? Insurance company. Who is the party who has done the mistake? Is the insured. So not necessary to prove the link between breach and loss. This is what I was telling you. You don't need to prove that because of the breach loss has occurred. As long as there is a breach of warranty, you can void the contract. Insurers cannot avoid the claim and then allow the policy to come. Please understand, insurers can say, there is a breach of warranty, so I am not paying you the claim. But happily keep the premium and say the policy is continuing. They cannot say that. The moment you are saying, I am not paying the claim, why? 
Because I am making the contract void. If contract is void from the day of breach, do you have a right to keep the premium for the remaining period? You don't have a right to keep the premium. You have to refund back that particular premium. It can't happen that I am happily not paying the claim and also saying contract is okay. Other part I am okay, only this I am not paying you the claim. It cannot happen that way. And then insurers can waive the breach and it need not necessarily mean that just because of breach of warranty, insurers have to compulsorily make it void. They have a right to make it void. They can say, okay, I avoid, I, I ignore that particular breach, let the policy continue. So they have that option to do any of those things. Am we clear? Next is this concept of excess deductible, aggregate deductible that you are talking about. Basically, excess relieves the insurer from the liability to pay the specified amount, otherwise payable under the policy, even though the particular event gives rise to a claim admissible under the other terms of the policy. The purpose of the excess, why do you put excess? To make insured their own insurer for a specified amount, encouraging extra risk management. Second thing is to relieve insurer of frequency losses. I don't want to have all the administrative expenses, all the small, small losses. And to reduce the overall claim by amount of excess which in every claim. So all these are the reasons why you put excess. Similarly, franchise, I think I told you that in a franchise what you do is, if it is below that particular amount, you pay the entire claim. Otherwise it acts like an excess. Below the claim, you don't particularly pay. So that's the basic difference between excess and franchise. So when amount is franchise exceeded, the claim is paid in full. Then you don't detect. The example is, for example, amount is, claim is 5000 and excess is 2500, then what do you do? Sorry, excess is 2500 and amount of claim is 5000, then you pay 5000 minus 2500, 2500. If the amount of claim is 5000 and the franchise is 2500, then you pay the entire 5000. Then the, the third thing is the franchise is 2500 and the claim is 2000, it is less than the franchise, you don't pay anything. So this is basically an example of issues with franchise. As I already told you, it should tempted to increase the claim to cross the franchise amount. As I told you, if the claim is 100 uh, and the franchise is 150, then he will be tempted to slightly increase it so that it crosses 150 because he will get the full claim. Next is, it should be delay repairs. Inflation could take care, take uh, it above the franchise. And third thing is, no cost in saving for the insurer over the year because in the excess, every claim you deduct. So overall, your claims ratio will come down. In a franchise, you don't get that particular advantage because once the claim exceeds that particular amount, your claim is going to be paid in full. So you don't get that advantage. So these are the disadvantages excess of a franchise. Deductible. Deductible is almost the same as excess. Very, very minor difference. Basically, if sum insured is 1000, deductible is 100, loss is 500, insurer pays 400. Whereas if the loss is more than the uh, sum insured, 1000, then insurer pays the entire thousand. That means you are deducting as if 1500 minus 100, 1400, because it's for, sum insured more than 1000, you pay that particular 1000. This is a very, very minor difference, only textbook difference. Uh, in a real practical use, you use excess and deductible in an interchangeable way, but there is a very minor difference between an excess and a deductible. But more importantly, and remember deductible can be common for all periods or it can be for various periods. That means I can say for fire deductible is this much, for act of God deductible is this much. Like that you can have separate deductibles or you can have a one common deductible for all the periods. Warranty deductible is possible. That means normally whatever is given in the policy is a compulsory deductible. But if some insurer insured says I want to voluntarily take a deductible, that means he is confident about his own risk management. So you give a discount in terms of the premium whenever somebody is choosing their own voluntary deductible. This is what you are asking about aggregate deductible. Now what is this aggregate deductible? Now several losses adversely affect the balance sheet if deductible is large. Now why do you keep a deductible or excess? Fundamentally because you don't want small losses as an insurance company. And as an insured, you also don't want the headache of reporting to the insurance company all small losses which your balance sheet can take, which are small enough. But if there are 10 small, small losses, they can become very big, which may be beyond your capacity. So then what will you do? That means, for example, if my deductible, I'll just run this off. Oh. 
Next thing is renewal procedure. Sure, sure. Why AC is not on, is it? Why I thought AC you can switch on, switch off so much. How much is off? That's all. AC can be switched. Another area which is again general area. What is the renewal procedure? And the considerations when you are renewing a fire policy. First thing you remember is well before renewal, insurer to decide whether to continue and they face what changes in terms, conditions, pricing. One very, very important thing is you should never tell an insurer in the last moment, oh, I had a bad experience with you, I don't want to renew your policy. Because at that last moment, if you are, you are, you are his insurer last year, at the last moment you tell him it will be becoming very difficult for him to get his renewal. So well before that insurance company should decide, underwriter should decide, does he want to renew or does he not want to renew. If he does not want to renew, you should inform the insured immediately that we have no intention of renewing. Please look out for your renewal if it's some other insurer. Suppose he wants to renew. He wants to decide based on his experience, based on the losses that happened, based on the risk management attitude that he has shown over the year. Does he want to give him a discount? Does he want to load his premium? Or does he want to do it at the same rate? Similarly, does he want to put new warranties conditions or does he want to remove some warranties and conditions that he put last year. So these are the calls that an underwriter will have to take well before the renewal date of a policy. This is one thing that you have to note. Second thing is he should send a renewal notice. This is a very very important thing as far as insurance company is concerned. One of the things that a lot of insurers do is Suppose I don't want to insure you, renew you, because I, have, I feel that you are a bad client or your claims ratio is bad or something of that sort. They don't want to tell you that. They will not even send you a renewal notice knowing that you will not remember the renewal. Which is a very, very wrong thing from a regulatory perspective. Because especially in personal insurances, it is compulsory so in some of the cases that you can't deny renewal of a policy. Health insurance, if you deny somebody who has been paying you premium, you cannot say that because you have made a claim, I am going to, you can increase my premium. You can't. Regulator will not allow a person to be, premium to be increased just because he made a claim. Fundamentally because it's a pool of money, some people will make some time, other people will make some other time. Only as a overall you can change it. So a lot of insurance companies very smartly what they do is, they will, because they don't want to displease the regulator, they will just not send you a new notice. They will hope that this guy will forget. If somebody is smart enough and remembers, then they will not lift his phone. They will cut off some other, they will ask 100 documents. So there's different ways in which they ensure that they don't renew a policy, which is not right. Fundamentally, it is required, if you don't want to renew, you have a right not to renew, then please inform him. If you want to renew, send him a renewal notice, renewal premium, how much uh, premium you going to charge for renewal, are you discounting it, are you loading it, what are the terms and conditions new that you are going to add, everything has to be informed to the client well before the renewal date so, so that he has a possibility of going to my competitor and finding out whether he gets a better deal or does not get a better deal. Next thing is change in risk or addition or deletion of location. So this is another thing that he needs to look at. Is there a change in the risk quality? Has a new location been added? Is it more risky? Is it less risky? Has a new asset been added? Has a new process been added? All these has to be looked at whenever you are talking about a renewal. Fourth thing is changes in protection systems. Has your fire protection system improved? Has it deteriorated? Have you introduced a new maintenance contract? Have you introduced sprinklers? Have you added new areas for sprinklers? All of that are to be looked at. Next thing is increased location exposure. Sometimes certain places exposure increases over time. Why does it increase? For example, flood. Till two years back, what was considered as a safe city from flooding. Now because the population has increased, concretization has increased, it may be a bad city. So your exposure has increased. You need to understand.
stand it as an underwriter and try to look at it. To ensure some insured, whether, please understand as I told you, what I insured for the last year has no significance. What I have to pay, what, when a loss occurs, either the new value or the depreciated value of the new property. That is what I will have to pay. So every year a sum insured has to increase or change based on the inflation. So you have to ask for renewal sum insured. Next thing is post loss list. If there was a loss, there is nothing wrong with a loss. Please understand insurance companies should never have a problem with a loss. Loss is good thing because that is the only time when you are actually showing your promise. But what is very important is after a loss, does he do any risk management control or risk control? Does he does do so that the same loss does not repeat itself? So that is the attitude, risk management attitude of the client. As an underwriter, in a renewal stage, you should look at that particular thing. What is he doing after a loss? And role of intermediary. Intermediary, please understand. You need to understand whether a broker is there, agent is there, what is his role? Can you do it directly? Can you actually have to need to go through the intermediary? All those things you need to be looking at. Whether the intermediary has paid you the premium on time, whether he has taken care of certain things, of his responsibilities, all of those he has to look at whenever you are giving a renewal. Next thing is endorsements. Why do you use endorsements? Fundamentally, when you give a policy, it's a contract. In a contract, you can't just change a contract. That means, for example, I give a contract, tomorrow I can't say, please give me back, I will cut it and I will change it. If you want to change a contract, you have to pass an endorsement to change the contract. So that is the whole purpose of an endorsement. Why do you need to pass endorsement? There can be many reasons. Some insurance has increased, you have to pass an endorsement because the value has increased. You added a new location or a new machine, you have to pass an endorsement. Last year there was no bank, I have taken a loan from a bank and I mortgaged that asset. So the bank has an interest, so I have to pass an endorsement to add the bank's interest. So there can be many reasons why you pass an endorsement. So fundamentally it is to incorporate, for example, change in name of insured. That means I sold off my property to somebody else, so that will be a reason. Incorporation of bank interest, I told you, bank may have given a loan. Change in address of location, last year my stock was located in this warehouse, I rented out a new premises, I am going there, that also you have to pass an endorsement. Material change in risk, change in occupation, till last year I was doing something, now I have changed the occupation. Change in some insured, some insured has increased, some insured has decreased, all of them to be endorsement. Change in period of insurance, I want to extend my policy by one month, again it's an endorsement. Additional discounts for leveling, I added a new sprinkler, so it deserves a sprinkler discount, I have to pass that discount, again through endorsement. These are some of the examples why endorsements are used. Endorsement is basically to change the original contract, you pass an endorsement. Directly. Next thing is the basis of some insured. As I told you already, there is a market value basis and a reinstatement value basis. Market value is nothing but reinstated value, reinstatement value minus depreciation. And market reinstatement value is a new replacement value as on the date of loss. And that is how you arrive at this particular sum insured. So when you arrive at a sum insured, you have to arrive at decide first decide whether it's a market value basis or a lean statement value basis. If you are on a market value basis, you should find out the new replacement value and from that you would deduct the depreciation. As you would appreciate, every area you cannot get a quotation for a new value. So there is something called as an index method. Uh, for example, in India, Reserve Bank of India every month publishes an index. Reserve Bank of India is the central bank of India. It's the bankers bank. So they publish an inflation index in terms of mechanical machinery, electrical machinery, civil works, all like that. So you can you can say for example 2015, the 2014 I said he built a building. You don't know what is the value going to be today. Best thing is if you know the value, you can use that value. Otherwise what you can do is you can use the RBI index. The RBI index will say 2014 the index was X or 100. 2019 the index is 120. So all you do is inflate it by 20%. So that every machine, every civil work, you are going to inflate it and then you are going to arrive at the replacement value and from that you remove the depreciation based on the straight line method you will be able to. It is a simple 
exercise is work, Excel sheet work. Once you put the formula, you can, because they will have an asset register. The asset register will have all the assets that they have. You need to know when they bought it, how much the age is over, what is the life of it. And then you need to know RBI index when they bought it, RBI index today. You put a formula, you will get the entire asset value. That is how you arrive at the sum insurance. Well, if you had a time, you would have gone more detail to how that is arrived. But for you at this time, it is enough to understand that you can get a replacement value either on a quotation basis or on an index basis. In both the basis, you can arrive at the particular thing. For, a, for once you get a quotation value or an index basis, you get the new replacement value. From that, you apply depreciation or straight line method, you get the market value. Right? And then pro rata condition of average, I already told you, under pro rata condition of average is under insurance principle. That means if you are insured or insured for 100, they are insured for 90, then I am only going to give you claim of 90 divided by 100. That is the principle of under insurance. Special condition of average, I already told you an IR policy, say 85 percent, up to 85 percent, I don't deduct any under insurance. That means any under insurance up to 15 percent, I am waiving off or any value which is only less than 85, then only I, I am going to deduct for under insurance, otherwise I am not going to deduct for under insurance. Next thing is, yeah, how do you arrive at the claim? Now let us look at a particular claim. So what we do is, I uh, will just give you an example of a possible problem that can come uh, in the examination also, uh, where uh, just take a case of a machine. It was bought in 2014 for 100 million. Okay. The loss took place in the loss in 2019. <coughs> okay. The sum insured of this machine was taken as 150 million. Okay. The value at risk, this is basically on an RIV basis, okay? Reinstated value clause is attached. And a fire box is the IER clause. It's a reinstated value basis. The sum insured they have taken is 150 million. The value at risk on the date of loss, value at risk, that means what the value is on the date of loss. That means that is nothing but what it should have insured for. He said 200 million. Okay, now the salvage that means after the claim, whatever is left out salvage, that was say 2 million. The excess of the policy is say 1 million. The loss in poor amount is loss is. That means there was a machine, it was not totally damaged, it was damaged partially to repair it. Some parts were replaced, the repair cost is 25 million. Repair cost is 25 million. Now suppose he says how much will be the claim here. So how do you do it? I would have preferred that you do it and then I uh, solve it. But because there is no time, I will just directly do it. Okay? So how do you do this case? First thing is we find out the loss. Loss is 25. Sir, how do we arrive at the value of this? Uh, value at risk. Value at risk is, I told you the, the particular machine, some insured, he has insured it for how much? 150 million. That he has taken. On the date of loss, I will either make a quotation or I will use the RBI index to arrive at what should have been the value of the particular machine. <coughs> if I suppose a machine that is not for underwriting, not for underwriting, it's a claim. This is a, this is a pro claim problem. No, no, for this quotation and uh, this one. For underwriting, same principle. Please understand, whatever is the basis on which you do underwriting, the same principle should be applied. If you take underwritten on market value, they also should be market value. If you underwritten on uh, uh, real estate value, they 
same also should be reached well. If an underwriting is expecting you to do, follow this method, when I'm going for the claim under insurance, I should follow the same method because I only advise him that this is the insurance method of doing it. So I have to follow the same method in the claim also. So I will elaborate the, who will elaborate? The loss suggestion of Sagaya will be elaborated this number. So first thing is you take the loss as 25 million because that has been given. Always remember, note it down. In a claim, the steps to be followed are B, S, U, E. D, S, U, E. D stands for depreciation. S stands for salvage. U stands for underinsurance. E stands for excess. If you follow different order, your answer will be different. The follow the answer, the insurers follow always this particular process. First, depreciation. Second, salvage. Third, under insurance. Fourth, excess. In a reinstatement value clause, I said is attached. Whenever reinstatement value clause is attached, depreciation is nil. You don't apply depreciation because you do you for all. So, depreciation is zero. So, first step is minus zero. So, you get it 25. Okay. Next should be salvage. What did I tell you the salvage? 2 million. So I should do minus 2 million. So I get 23 million. Next I should do under insurance. Under insurance means what? 23 million multiplied by what is the sum insured? 150 divided by what is the value at risk? 200. This is not under insurance, this is claim after under insurance. Am I clear here? Under insurance is 50, 50 by 200 or 25 percent. So I am directly doing the claim after under You can do two steps. You can find under insurance and then claim or you can do directly claim. That means claim after under insurance is equal to 23 million multiplied by the sum insured divided by value at risk. So 23 into 150 by 200, which is nothing but 3 sir, 4 sir. Okay, I will look for you if you don't mind, I will change the sandwich to 1 million. Okay, so just to do easy calculation. So if I do sandwich to 1 million, this is minus 1 million, so it becomes 24. So I will do 24 into 3 by 4. So 4, 6 are 24. So this will be 18. Then, how, all of you are clear how 18 million has come? So it is 18 million. From that excess is 1 million, minus 1. So what is the claim I am going to pay? So, the claim I am going to pay is 17 million. Is this clear to all of you? Okay. Now suppose I change the question and say the policy is same question with a market value basis. Then, I have to start with generalization. So what I will do in that case? Depreciation will not be zero. I know it's a 2014 machine. It is lost in 2019. It is five years. That is the age of the machine. I have not given here the life of the machine because it was a RIV basis. But if it is a market value question, they will also give you the life of the machine. Suppose the life of the machine is 420 years. Life equal to then, what is depreciation? Into 5 divided by 20 is the depreciation. So, 5 divided by 20, so is what? Is how much? 25 into 5 by 20 is 1 by 4, 6.25. So, if I remove 6.25, it will be 18.75 million. Am I clear? So, the claim after depreciation will be 25 minus 25% of 25, which is nothing but 18.75 million. Is this clear to all of you? No doubt. Very important from an examination part of the 18 million, 18 parts of my year. So this is after depreciation. After that, what should I do? I should remove salvage. Minus salvage is 1. So it is 17.75. Then what should I do? Then under insurance. Under insurance, same principle. What is the sum insured? Divided by what is the value? So anybody has a calculator? Into 3 by 4 or you can just do 3 by 4. 4 4 the 16, 1 7, 4 4 the 16, 1 5, almost 4 4 the 16 into 3, 4 12, 1, 12, 
That means after three months, for example, I have taken an escalation of 10%. The first method I told you is directly increase the substitute by 10%. Then you will be paying 10% extra premium. But you know if the loss occurs in the first January or second January, you will not even use that escalation. You have wasted your premium. So when you take an escalation clause on first January, you insure it only for 150 million, but you take an 10% escalation clause. Then every day 1 by 365 of 10% of 150 will be added to the submission. After 3 months, how much will be added? 2.5%. After 5-6 months, 5%. After 9 months, 7.5%. After 1 year, that is the rate occurs on the last day, the full 10% drop will be added. That is how the steel clients go only every day 1 by 365. What does it mean? When I am charging a premium directly by increasing, I am charging extra 10%. But when I am doing for escalation clause, is it logical for me to charge extra 10%? No, because I don't know whether the claim occurs. Claim occurs starting end. So I should only consider the average. So that the average is 5%. If it is 0 and 10, it is 5%. So I only charge on 5%. I don't charge all that means either I half the rate and charge on 10%. That means that is the whole principle of escalation. So escalation clause in India, maximum escalation where firewalls are given is 25%. You can't do more than 25%, which is logical because I don't think anyone is expecting more than 25% inflation in any particular year. Second thing is additional premium, 50% of the final rate charge, selected percentage. I told you the logic why only 50% you take because you don't know when the claim will come. It is increasing on every day. Probably on every day. Whereas if you have taken 10%, every day it is 10% more. So that's why you are charging 10% extra. Here you are only going to charge 50% of that. Submission at any point of time will apply after application of this escalation clause. Applicable for building, it's not a for stocks. Escalation is applicable for building, machinery and accesses, not applicable for stocks. Applicable for both market value policies and distributed value policies. Condition of average you apply. That is after escalation, you still apply the condition of average. Automatic increases from inception rate to data operation of any distributed value. I told you every day, so you will keep on increasing your monthly statement. So, that is what is the escalation clause. When you talk about claim, please remember, claim for a building can be done on market value, can be done on real estate value. Sometimes there is something called obsolete, that means there are very, very old buildings, you no longer can build in such a building. All those can be covered under obsolete. Similarly, machine also you can have obsolete, market value, or real estate. But for stocks, it's always on market value basis. So that is how the basis of it. You cover it, you pay the claim for some other product. Yeah. When you talk about basis of claim settlement, please understand that when you say restatement value clause attached, you give a new for the old. But very, very important statement in the thing it says if property that is damaged, property is not destroyed, it should be repaid or repaired as similar property. If property is damaged, the damage portion should be repaired or restored. In neither case to the replacement or restoration mean that the property is better or more than its condition than you. That means you cannot be having a better product or a better machine or a better building. That is what improvement. If there is an improvement, then as an insurance company, I am going to deduct for the improvement. I am not going to give you the new. I can give you the new exactly the same naked capacity, but I can't give you something which is better than the old one. And hence, I will deduct it for if you look at your iPhone, for example, you had an iPhone 5. Now you can't get an iPhone 5, when you lose it, you will get an iPhone 10 on left, whatever it is. Now iPhone 10 is probably cheaper than at what cost you have bought, bought iPhone 5, but 10 times better features. Now, as an insurance company, we are not going to give these better features. We are saying iPhone 5, today what it costs if you are going to get it, or you buy iPhone 11, whatever is the improvement, suppose it's 50% better and more efficient than iPhone 5, I'm going to pay that lower than 
That's a negotiation that happens between an insurance surveyor and the client of how much is the difference of uh, betterment that they are going to get whenever you are going to take it. So, higher technology, higher capacity, improvements. Insurance should, insurance should bear the cost related to improvements. The insurance company is not going to pay for improvements. Another very, very important question that we can usually come in an examination is that I'm sorry, not on this one. Will this complete this property and should lost or destroyed? Then we will pay for its building, rebuilding or replacement of similar property in addition as good, but not by the time. If property is damaged, we will pay. This is the same thing that I told you. Anything better, we are not going to pay. Another very, very important thing. Uh, yeah, this is all the things. Yeah, please take it off. Please don't confuse. Reinstatement value clause and reinstatement of property. Reinstatement of property means that insurance company is taking over the responsibility of reinstating the property. Normally, insurance company does not like to reinstate a property. It only likes to pay the cash in the line. That means if this building is damaged, Principle of indemnity says, I am going to put you back in the same position. Does not mean insurance company is saying, I will now bring the, uh, the masons and workers. One minute, let me come in. I will bring the masons, workers, and other people and start constructing it. All it is saying is that whatever it costs to rebuild, I am going to pay. That is what it means. But sometimes what happens is, many insurers. <coughs> There is always there can be a conflict between the insured and the insurer when the insured says you are going to pay me 1 million, I can't insure it in 1 million, it's going to cost me 1.5 million. Now, there has to be some common ground between insurance company and insured and that has to be brought by the surveyor or the law firm. If that does not come. And insurance company is very sure that they can do it in 1 million. Then what they will do? Then they will say, okay, I will take over your property, I will reinstate and bring you back to your property. That means the insurance company, in the contract of insurance, keeps a right, not a duty, keeps a right to reinstate the property. Why? In order to take care of clients <coughs> who are acting smart and saying that give me more and you are convinced that it doesn't deserve to be given more. That you can easily repair it in that particular cost that you are talking about. So I hope all of you are clear between the difference between reinstatement value clause, which is new for old, and reinstatement of property, which in a claim, what you are trying to do? You are trying to take over the property of the insured and then repair and replace and then give it back to him in a better condition or in a condition it was before the term was. So now what are the conditions applicable if the reinstatement is done? Insurers prefer to pay money in moment of loss. That is always preference because we are not experts in constructing and all that. So we don't like to take over property. Our preference is always to pay money. You do your repairs, you do your reinstatement, I pay you money in moment of that. But in rare circumstances, however, sometimes reinstatement is the last resort to identify insurance. As the last resort, they use this particular technology. What do they do? But what do they say? When we decide, suppose I as an insurance company, I don't have a duty, I have a right. If I decide to use my right and reinstate your property, you can't tell me, okay, you are telling me I will reinstate, okay, do it for me. I am not going to help you in any way. Because they are going to say that, if the conditions of the policy says, you will have to provide me at your cost all the plans, documents, designs, books, information, because without that I can't do anything. If I don't give me design everything, how can I rebuild it for you? So you have to give it to me. That's a part of the <laughs> Next thing is, which we, we will not be obliged to reinstate property exactly but only in a satisfactory manner as circumstances allow. So if I take over, the client will say, you told me you will bring me back to the same condition. It is not in the same condition. So again, we put a condition in the policy, we say, we are saying as satisfactory as possible, not exactly, we are not going to do it. So this is how insurance companies protect themselves by ensuring that, putting the clauses. The maximum amount we will pay in the monitor will be some insured. 
Do you understand? Always someone should be the limit. I am not going to pay. Spend more than the someone should. Next. Deal statement is used as a last resort because why do people use it as a last resort? Because cash payment is simpler. I would rather prefer to cash rather than do all this. Second thing is if we reach insurance in each case, quality and speed of execution becomes their responsibility. If insurance says I am going to take over, insured will say, you are taking too long. If I had done it, I would have done it two months, you are taking four months. I am losing my profit out of that. So he will blame you. So it becomes a problem. If someone should run out before work is completed, the insured will object to how the work was done. If suppose the entire commission is over in repairing, you take over, you act smart, you say I can do it, you are starting doing it. And then you see that it's becoming costly. The entire submission is done. Can you leave it in the between and say, insured will say, if I had done, I could have done it within that cost. You acted smart and told me that you are going to take over. Now do it. So it becomes very, very difficult to do. The insurer cannot withdraw from the decision to reach your monastery. He cannot say, after two months of doing it, you will find it very difficult. He can't say, now I am going to. Once he takes the decision, he has to be sure about it. If premises are under insurance, insurer will do this in the benefit from average cost. Because once he has taken over, applying under insurance becomes very, very difficult. So he loses that benefit. However, sometimes it's a viable option. When is it viable? Where the insured refuses to modify a claim considered by insurers to be excessive and excessive cost to reach it. That's what I told you. Second thing is where insurers can replace an article at a wholesale price. Sometimes insurers, for example, it's not related to fire, but for example, it's a product, water claim, windshield claim. Suppose windshields, there are a lot of windshield claims that insurance companies face. Suppose I buy bulk windshields as an insurance company because I every day I'm going to get windshield claims. I will get it at a very good price. So it may be very better for me to say, any windshield claim, I am not going to pay cash. You give it to me, I will get it replaced. Windshield. So when you get in a bulk, you may do it. Or when doubt exists concerning the value of the claim, but there is insufficient evidence to prove declaration. That means you are not very sure, you can't decline it because you don't have proof of it, then you will take over because you will be able to get extra lot of proof when you are taking it over. So that's what also useful thing. Having said that, I have worked in insurance companies for 30 years. I have never, we have, you, have, you threaten people, but you never take over. Because it's not your expertise, you never do this. But you will use it. If somebody is acting smart, you will say, if you are not agreeing for this, I am going to take over. So that's how you do it, but you usually don't use this material. Am I clear? In the examination, do not confuse between reinstated value question and reinstatement of property. Reinstatement of property, the question usually is, it's a last resort. When is it viable? Those type of questions will be there. Then the answer should be related to this. If it is a reinstatement value loss, whatever you read before is what it should be. Am I clear? Yeah. Now the another important thing that you remember is when you have a loss, what are the factors that are that will be taken into consideration which will increase the time it takes to redeem? First thing is nature of redeem. Suppose there is solid construction, it is going to take more time. It's a very, very temporary construction, it's going to take less time. Second, machinery features, it's a very, very special machine. Made to order, only one manufacturer who has a lot of demand, it will take a lot of time. If it's over the counter machine, I can buy it on the over the counter, it's going to take less time. Next, availability of skilled labor, you require skilled labor to do it. Skilled labor or my, my competitor has taken over, I don't have the skilled labor, it's going to take more time. I have skilled labor in my hand, it's going to take less time. Four, repair facilities. Repair facilities are in your side. You can do it fast. Repair facilities are within India. You can do it fast. Suppose repair can only be happening in Finland or Germany or somewhere. Then I have to send it. I have to get it back. It's going to take a lot of time. Attitude of government authorities. Sometimes customs, they will just not allow your goods to move. Those are things which will take you a long, long time. Sometimes, when a loss occurs, the factory inspector who used to take a bribe and allow you to do run the factory, even if dangerous things were there, if one or two people die, for six months he will say, I will not allow you to start the factory. Now, then it should go to take a huge amount of time, is it not? So these are the things that may happen. 
denial of access. Sometimes, this, I'm in a hilly area, there's only one dark road. That road is damaged. There's an earthquake, something of my machine is affected. I have to get that machine from Hyderabad. Hyderabad it will come by truck, it will pass through the dark road and the dark road is damaged. So there's a denial of access. So you will have a problem with that and that will incur a loss. And relationship will come. Sometimes, these are examples that happen there. For example, China. India had a problem with China on the Dogla machine. There was a lot of machines were imported from China. China is very fast in actually delivering new goods. They are very much faster than any other country in the world if you want to replace it. But because there was a problem between India and China, they did not release any Indian goods. No, you are because of problems in the relationship, your prepares got very much delayed. Fundamentally because the Chinese government was not allowing any transfer of goods to India during that particular period when there was an issue. So relationship with countries also become very important. Which are going to increase the time it takes to reinstate. So with this we have completed the practices. Now we get into business introduction. Okay? Any questions are practiced? My summing should is 100 million. Okay? This is policy from 1st January 19 to 31st December 19. 1st April there was a policy. Okay. Okay. Now, escalation taken is 24. Escalation taken is good. Now, the value at risk, I will use the same method that I used to find out the value at risk. That means on first table, what is the value at risk? Suppose I find the value at risk is 110. So what I will do is, I will not do 100 divided by 110. I will say three months are over, we have taken a 20 percent escalation. 20 percent means for three months I should give 5 percent escalation. So I would say 100 plus 5 percent is 105. So the submit should have just 105. So when I am doing the under insurance calculation, I will do 105 divided by. I am not going to do 100 divided by 100. So the multiplied by the chilling after the decision of the The question was like, uh, suppose talks happens on one day and the uh, process of assessment and all those things. Okay, you are saying restate, actual restate, yes. yes. So fundamentally, please understand, it is dependent on the policy wording. The policy wording, some policy wording says, as of the date of loss. Second policy wording says, as of the date of restate. If it says date of reinstatement, all this calculation will be date of reinstatement. If it says date of loss, all this calculation will be date of loss. It depends on the wording that you have used. Right. Shall we get into business interview? So, as I, so far, whatever we study is all about my material damage. So, I have also said there is a lot of problems. We need to clearly study about the soft problems. Please understand that when you have a material damage, the fire loss, the earthquake loss, the cyclone loss, your machinery is affected, cleaning is affected, stocks are affected. But you will have an interruption. That means your production will stop or will reduce. I have three lines, one line is affected, only two lines will work, I am only able to produce 66%. So my turnover will reduce. If my turnover will reduce, I hope all of you will agree, my net profit will reduce. My net profit will be affected very badly. Then my net profit is affected very badly. What is going to happen? I, my profitability is coming down. But it doesn't end with that. I will also have to incur certain expenses whether I am producing or not producing. Example is salaries. I have to pay the salaries whether I am producing or I am not producing. Bank's interest. I have to pay bank's interest. Bank is not going to say, okay, you had a loss, so don't pay me interest. They will ask me 
advertisement. Depreciation advertisement. He sometimes said advertisement have to do. So lot of expenses, office expenses, everything. These are all called fixed expenses or fixed charges. So my net profit will come down. In addition, I will have to incur fixed expenses. So what a loss of profits policy will do is it protects your balance sheet. So what does it pay? It not only pays your loss of net profit, it also pays the loss to your standing charges. And to just give you, if you are a turnover, turnover, from turnover you remove variable expenses, you remove fixed expenses, you get net profit. All of you agree? Turnover minus my expenses, fixed and variable, will give me net profit. Turnover minus variable expenses will give me what is known as gross profit. Or net profit plus fixed expenses will give me gross profit. So, gross profit is turnover minus variable expenses. This is called the difference method. Gross profit is also net profit plus standing fixed expenses. This is called the addition method. So gross, both will be arrived at the same number. What are variable expenses? Variable expenses are those expenses which reduce in direct proportion to my production. If I am producing 100 million units, if my expense is X, if my production reduces to 50 million, my expenses will reduce to half. If my production increases to doubles, my expenses also double. Which are those example expenses? One of the best examples is raw materials. Because if I am producing X, I require Y raw materials. If I am producing 2X, I require 2Y. If I am producing X by 2, I require Y by 2. So that is the direct proportion they will change. Anything which does not change in direct proportion will be called fixed expenses for us. It may be semi semi variable, semi fixed. For example, electricity. They will not directly reduce in the same proportion because there is something called minimum demand charges. You will have to pay minimum demand charges whether you are consuming electricity or not. Electricity also you use it in the office. Your factory may be burnt out. In the office you are going to use. So fundamentally, this power and electricity that are there, it is quite possible. They are partially fixed, partially variable. For all purpose, we use them as fixed. Only variable is directly in proportion. Similarly, wages. It is possible that you say, if I have an interruption for six months, I am removing all the workers. And I am not going to be expensive expend anything on wages, then they become variable. But is it practically possible to remove all workers? No. You will have to keep workers. So, you will have to use them as fixed charges. There is something called dual wages. Fundamentally what you say is, for first two months, I will keep all workers, so I call for 100%. Two months to six months, I will remove 50%. So, I call for 50%. After six months, I remove all the 100%. Then I call for so, they are, they are not dual various basis. It's not a time to talk too much into the loss of profits because we don't have that much time. But fundamentally understand, even expenses which are partially variable and partially fixed, also for us, we treat in the loss of profits as a fixed expense. You can cover it as separately, how much percentage you can calculate and do it. But then, if you do a mistake, it's possible you suffer in it. So that's the reason why better to insure it for more rather than insure it for less. If you have time, I would have not told you how exactly you can do partially, but at this particular time, enough for you to understand that variable means exactly in proportion they should change. One of the best examples of variable is raw material cost, which will exactly change based on the production. Most of the expenses usually are fixed expenses. So how do you so what are we covering? We are covering gross. Gross profit is net profit 
plus variables or fixed expenses. Fixed expenses in insurance parlance are called as standing charges. Standing charges means fixed expenses. So it is net profit plus standing charges or turnover minus variable expense. In both ways you can get the gross profit. When you do turnover minus variable expense, it is called as difference method because of subtracting. When you do net profit plus standing charges, it is called as addition method. In addition to this, we cover increased cost of working. Many a times, I have to spend more to produce. Why? For example, my machine is damaged. I can get it from C. I originally bought it from C. But I can get it by year by spending more so that I can reduce the cost of interruption. So that is all increased cost of working. I may put more workers. I may give overtime to workers. All these are increased cost of working. For example, there is a telecom company. Suppose there is a friend. Can telecom company manage to have a 7 days, 10 days, 15 days breakdown? No. You will see that in 2 days, 3 days of flight, your mobile phone company, even in the worst internet areas, in hours they will work, on worst case, two days, three days, your mobile will be working. So in those cases, they will not have loss of gross profit, but they will have a huge increase cost of working. So what the loss of profit policy covers is not only the gross profit, it also covers the increased cost of profit. Is this concept related or So this is yes. so, this. So, this concept is clear to all of you. Let's get into some of this. Yeah. So, why do you need a business interruption? You will lose your orders, you lose your customers, losing income, profits, ongoing costs, having to continue to pay salaries and wages. These are the reasons why you need to. So, you have material damage cover, which also we already did. So, you need to have real coverage, which is a balance sheet protection. If you attach a loss of profits policy to a fire policy, it's called fire loss of profits. If you attach a loss of profits to a machinery policy, it's called machinery loss of profits. There's an engineering insurance called EAR, project insurance called erection of risk and contractors of risk. If you attach a policy to a ER policy, then or a CER policy, it is called advanced loss of profits. If you attach a loss of profit to a very policy, you is called delaying startup insurance. So these are the various names for loss of profits. What we are really interested in is this FLOP of that. Uh, I have given an example. All it says is, for example, opening stock 850 crores, purchases 3000 crores, uh, sales 5000 crores, closing stock 850 crores, wages 50 rent, power, taxes, insurance, auditor fee, subscription, rent for advertising. These are the various expenses. If you look at it, if a damage to the building takes place and restructuring takes six months, at the close of the financial sales of 50 percent below normal, or the additional expenditure to 50 crores was added, what happens to the profit and loss account? As you will see, opening stock remains the same, purchases come down by half because if the production is done, come down by half, purchases will come down by half, whereas all other expenses you will continue to incur. So your loss of profits, your net profit will be affected, and your uh, standing charges also will be continuing to be incurred. So this is an example you go through when you uh, go back to the room. I don't have time to go through each of the steps. But fundamentally what it's trying to tell you is that the variable expenses will change as per the reduction in turnover, but your fixed expenses will continue to incur. So that is why your profit will want to change. Now very very important in loss of profit insurance is definitions. I have given all important definitions in your presentation. Whether you read your textbook or not, please don't forget to read the presentation. If you are reading the presentation two, three times, you will be very sure of what the exam. So, it is giving every important point that is required. So, what you do is, you look at the definitions. Definitions means word by word it should come. 
If it's an expression, if I don't say define, you can do your own words. But the moment you say definition, these are the words that should come. And these are all things I don't think I'll get into each of the definitions, but just understand some of the definitions which are important. It's basically gross profit. Some produced by adding net profit to the amount of issued standard charges. Why are we using the word not standing charges but issued standard charges? Is the insured has a right not to insure a freestanding charge. He can decide, I only want to cover interest because my bank is forcing me to cover it. Or he can say, I am not going to cover this standing charge. Wages are not going to cover. He has a right. So when he does it, you only are going to cover the insured standing charge and not the total. That's why you are not using the word standing charge. You are saying insured standing charge means he is covering whatever he believes. This is the that profit you are given, that no one interrupted. Another important thing in a loss of profits policy is, you have the policy period. Policy period is always one year. But what is interrupted period? There is another period called interrupted period. Interrupted period is, when a loss occurs, for how much maximum time you should be covered? What will be dependent on? It is dependent upon your ability to reinstate in a worst case loss. For example, if this entire building is damaged by fire, how long will I take to rebuild this building? If I am going to take it 6 months, my indemnity period is going to be 6 months. If I am going to take 36 months, my indemnity period is going to be 36 months. In a format, maybe it's at 6 months. In a small degree site, it may be only 2 months or 1 month. Your indemnity period can be any period depending upon the amount of time you will take to reinstate. Whereas, your policy period will always be one year. That means your loss should occur in the policy period, but the amount of time you take to, to reinstate your property, that becomes Indian period. That is the period that has to be selected whenever you are buying a loss of profits insurance. Have I clear? Have you understood the concept of Indian period? It's not just policy period. Indian period is the, 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 the period beginning with the occurrence of damage when the loss occurred. Is it 12 months, 24 months, 36 months, 3 months? You can decide that. They are after doing the results of the business and affected positives of damage. That means your balance sheet is affected, your profit and loss is affected, till whatever period of time, because of the loss of damage, your profit and loss is completely affected. That is your medium period. Maximum is what you are selected. Even if it is affected for more, I am not going to pay because you pay me premium related to only 12 months or 16 months or 18 months, whatever you are selected. That's the maximum amount to pay as far as the insurance company is concerned. Is this clear? So what are the standard charges? The other important question would be name a few standard charges. Interest is there, depreciation is there, wages should be there, director's fees, electricity charges, traveling vehicle expenses, stationery, pensions. You can't avoid paying pensions. They are all fixed expenses. Standard charges are fixed expenses. These are, if somebody has asked them to examples, all these are examples of the standard charges. Again, some of the uh, definitions are rate of gross profit, annual turnover, standard turnover. These are very important definitions that you have to know. I will explain with examples, not at this point of time, because of lack of time, but just go through those particular things. And if, you have, if somebody has any doubt, if you have your doubt, my mobile number, you can WhatsApp me your doubt, or you can email me your doubt, then I will try to reply before your exam. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, please understand whatever numbers that we are talking about, you have to are based on your past data. Because your gross profit thing, you don't know what's going to be the because you are covering the future. <coughs> so you need to adjust for trends. So you will always adjust for the trends. What are those trends? As my uh, turnover is increasing, or my turnover is decreasing. Market is in a recession. Nobody is buying cars. You can't say last year I made a gross profit of X. This year also my gross profit will be X. It may be less because the market is going through a very bad phase. So all those trends will be adjusted whenever you are adjusting a loss of profits. How do you pay? You do you do the reduction in turnover. The insurance will be gross profit due to reduction in turnover and increased cost of working in respect of this. That's what you have to pay. Any sound saved, you should have your detect, that's what is detected. What are the key features of the loss of profit? Please remember I am repeating, 
Definitions are very important. Don't forget to read definitions. Next, give to the class proposal annually it is regular premium. That means you are talking about the future. You don't know what the cost is going to be. So when your annual report, when your annual report is ready, when your uh, financials are audited, at that time you can submit the actual numbers and you can adjust the premium based on the actual numbers. This is a material damage also very very important that which says that unless you have a material damage loss, your loss of profits policy will not be. You cannot have no material damage loss but a loss of profits policy. So this is called a material damage loss. That means one of the insured parents should act in a material damage. That should lead to a loss of turnover. That should lead to a loss of gross profit. Then only I am covering it. Because of some other reason, your gross profit is coming down. I am not liable for it. I am not going to pay. That's all. He is taking place between the other also. Condition of average under insurance should be applicable based on what ought to be the sum issued versus what is the sum issued. Addition basis I told you. Difference basis I told you. I told you dual wages also. Very nice. You can decide. For a few months I will cover 100 percent wages. After that I am confident that I can remove workers. So I will reduce it and I will cover only part part of it as far as the wages. When there is something called contingent business interruption, please understand that, for example, I am a, I'm a manufacturer of automobiles, I am Maruti Industries. I manufacture cars. Suppose a company X is supplying engines to me. Nothing happened to my factory, but the factory which is supplying engines to me, his factory has a fire. If he doesn't supply me engines, can I, can I manufacture cars? I can't. Nothing happened in my factory. This is called contingent business. Then my loss of profits will be there. My balance sheet is affected. This is called contingent business. That means contingent to an accident occurring somewhere else, I will lose my loss of profits. You can cover that also. That means it can be supplier's extension. That means a supplier has been has a loss of damage due to insured peril. I my loss of profit is affected, I can cover it. Customer's extension, sometimes. I may have cap two customers or one or two customers. If that nothing happened to me, but if the customer is had a fire, he will not buy from me. So I will have a loss. That also can be covered. Sometimes public utilities like electricity is affected. Your gas is affected. Water supply is affected. Because of which you can have a loss of profits. Again, that is called a contingent business interruption. Contingent business interruption means loss occurs somewhere else. You have a loss. Example is, for example, when Thailand flood took place, the huge amount of losses are faced by Japanese insurers because majority of the parts for either Japanese automobile companies or Japanese electronics companies were manufactured in Thailand. So when Thailand flood took place, they were not getting parts, so they were not able to manufacture their cars and electronic products. So they were affected. So you will have a lot of losses related to contingent business interruption. Have I clear here? So last thing is risk perception. It's a very easy chapter. You just need to questions like can be like what is the use of a risk inspection report for insured, for insurer? What is it? We already go on through a lot of the things of what a risk inspection is all about. You just need to uh, write the points. How is it useful? For example, what is the object of a risk inspection report? It is to help reinsurance underwriters, fix retention, and various blocks, process details, all that. Okay. Scope of a risk inspection report, it should talk about general information, lighting, heating, process utilities, storage, machinery and all that. Management, supervision, claims, risk improvement measures, report, clarity, concerns. Basically reports should not be too long or too short. It should be clear, it should be concise, it should be readable. Second thing is clear from ambiguities. You can't write something somewhere, something else exactly opposite somewhere else. And all relevant information the more number of words. Because if you write pages and pages, it's quite possible people don't read it. So these are the features that are risk inspection report. <coughs> benefits, these are all standard questions. What is the benefit for a proposal? Being able to obtain insurance, price being reduced, reduction, all the sub things. Very simple things. For an insurer, what are the benefits? What are the issues? For a broker, what is the benefit? Activities, what's the benefit of a risk inspection report? 
What are the post loss survey contain? You will contain cause of loss, whether warranties have been complied with, Le what, what are the learnings from the loss from the underwriters, what are the mistakes done in underwriting, what are the loss recommendations, what is the risk management attitude of the customer, what is the value add that the broker has done. All of these are part of, part of the UX survey, uh, post loss survey. Everything restriction that we talked about before is pre-underwriting. This is post loss. Post loss, these are the advantages. There is something called PML or EML. Probable maximum loss. EML means estimated maximum loss. This is used for, it is an internal thing that you calculate basically for your internal purpose of reinsurance. That means for reinsuring, you are going to decide based on the PML, not based on the sum insured. So, the concept of pre-will PML is that in a worst case accident, of a usually calculated for fire and explosion, what is the loss or amount that I can expect in a worst case? That for example, a steel plant. A steel plant will be 10 kilometers length, 10 kilometers breadth. You don't expect 100% loss. One block may be affected, two blocks may be affected. So what is the loss that may happen? Based on that you do your reinsurance. That is the whole concept behind the probable maximum loss or the estimated maximum loss. So what you do is you establish a concept called single risk. That means in one fire or one explosion, how many blocks will be affected? That's a single risk. And arrive at the value related to that. That will be your payment. Based on that you do your, it doesn't mean the original contract will change. Original contract is for full sum issue. This is your back end for your reinsurance purpose. If a full loss occurs beyond your PML, you have to pay the full loss. But as far as the client is concerned, this is the most important thing. And PML should be both for material damage as well as for loss of profits. Jointly put together, what are the worst case loss that can actually happen? Theory of rating, again an important uh, subject. Uh, basically, this is the concept of burning cost, again not necessarily related only to, please understand rating can be experience rating or exposure rating. Experience rating fundamentally means that based on the past experience you are pricing it. When can you do experience rating? When you have enough past claims data. But for example, it's, uh, you, are, you are rating an aeroplane. You will not have many aeroplane uh, falls and aeroplane uh, uh, crashes and other things. So you can't get experience rating, you have to do exposure rating. Petrochemical risk, you are not going to have every year one explosion or something of the sort. So you have to do exposure rating. Whereas motor cars, you can do experience rating. Accidents, you can do experience rating. Death, life insurance, you can do experience rating. So these are the two basic ways you do it. There is a concept called as burning cost. Burning cost is a pure risk cost. That means, just to pay your losses, how much premium should I charge? That is the burning cost. How do you calculate a burning cost? It takes into account past claims data and inflation provisions. Expenses and profit are then added to arrive at a premium. The assumption is that claims will continue to occur as in the past level. At least three years claims experience is required. Confirmation required that no major change in risk or coverage or deductibles. One of large losses may be ignored because if you consider one of large losses, your burning cost will become very high, you will be out of the market because you don't, if you don't expect that loss to occur every three years, then there is no reason why you have to consider the entire thing. You may consider partially or you may ignore it based on the calculation that you do. Example 1. Year 1 claim is 50,000. Inflation is 30% over 3 years. Year 2 20,000, 20% 20 over 3 years. Year 3 is 30,000, 10% inflation. Then what you will do? 50,000 into 1.3 plus 20,000 into 1.2 plus 30,000 into 1.1 is 1,22,000. So the burning cost is the average of that 1,22,000 by 40,667. That will be the burning, burning cost. How do you arrive at the premium? To the burning cost, you add, add management expenses, add the profit margin that you want, you add that and then future inflation you add and then you get the premium that you are going to charge. That is the method you use for arriving at the premium. Very, very simple calculation. Go through the calculation. If you have any doubt, you can ask me later. Yeah. How do you rate a fire policy? Fire policy is rated basically one on the occupancy. The chemical plant will be rated more than a steel plant. 
the steel plant will be rated more than an office block. Office block will be more rated more than a house or a building. So that is the occupancy of the country. Second thing is construction. As I told you, you can have superior construction. Construction is based on walls, roof and floor. Don't expect mineral foundation to be affected. You can exclude it. For earthquake, you can cover it. The other you want to do it is ask you, what are the amount of coverages you require? What has been the claims ratio? All these other questions 